Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is my pre-show live stream for episode, where are we up to? Seven of, um, not House of the Dragon, I always get myself confused on these ones. This one is the Rings of Power and I've got some very special guests today. Would you please welcome Dave and Johnny from the Melonheads. Hello. Hey guys. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Excellent. Do you want to just uh, introduce the, the Melonheads Council of Elrond podcast? What, sure. What is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're brothers. Uh, I'm Johnny and the other one is Dave. And we're collectively known online as the Melonheads. And we are the hosts of a Tolkien podcast called the Council of Elrond, which can be found on Spotify and all the other usual podcast places. And we've been doing that for about two years now. And we also were on YouTube now uh, as of recently, so you can go there and see us in the flesh. And that's also called uh, the Melonheads or the Council of Elrond. You can find us under both of those names. And again, if you're looking for us with the Melonheads, that's Melon with two L's. As if you've seen the Fellowship of the Ring, you know that the, the password to the, the Mines of Moria, the Doors of Durin is Melon. And that's Melon. how we got our name. So... I think our name is quite fitting because, as we like to say, it's Tolkien at its core, but it's really just, it sounds a bit silly. And uh, that's <laughs> how we like to think of ourselves. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We just uh, like to have some, you know, Tolkien discussions and have a bit of fun on our podcast. Excellent. I agree. <laughs> good, good. And if you're in agreement all the way through, then this is going to be a very short live stream. But let's, <laughs> um, uh, let's just do a couple of things quickly before we get into it. First of all, this is a charity live stream. This is in aid of Alzheimer's care and research. All of my live streams all the way through the show uh, for the pre-show live streams will be charity live streams. I think we're up to 4,700 for the season so far. Uh, let's see if we can push that up a little bit more. I want to get to 5,000 as soon as we can. So um, basically what I'm saying is that if you are enjoying the show, if you're enjoying these live streams, this is the way I would love you to uh, to show your appreciation uh, if you can afford it. So uh, there should be a link watching live or later so link somewhere uh, on your screen <laughs> to donate. The second thing to say is that we have had the news this week um, season two of the Rings of Power is now in production. So uh, that's the sort of the big update on where we're at. In terms of when that means we're going to see season two, it's not 100% clear. I think probably not for a while, though. The showrunners have said there's a uh, new big article in Hollywood Reporter, uh, which I think I tweeted out just before we went live, actually, if you're interested. They said something like, I imagine we'll be working on this for the next two years. So... A year or so of filming, I guess, and maybe, I mean, last time it was 13 months of post-production. I imagine they will manage to speed that up in uh, for season two once they've got into the rhythm with these things, but do not expect it before 2024, I wouldn't have thought. So those things um, out of the way. Uh, guys, why don't we just start off, how are you enjoying the show? We're six episodes in now, we've only got two more to go. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think... Both of us collectively are both loving it, uh, loving it and kind of disagreeing with a lot of the material that's coming out as well. But like for the most part, I will enjoy it. I will be blown away and amazed. And then I'll go on to Twitter and read everything that's terrible th about the show. And I'll go, OK, yeah, there was a couple of bits here that didn't make sense canonically. And this was a bit silly and that was a bit daft. But all in all, I think the good outweighs the bad. And some of the things that we knew were great going into it have still been just as strong from the very first episode, such as music, orcs, um, sets, visuals in general. Visuals, yeah, in general. Um, I suppose some of the writing, some of the dialogue has been questionable at best, but it's still it's still enough. And I like how every episode keeps me guessing, keeps me wanting more, and not just for mainstream audiences, for people that actually know the source material we, we still don't know what's going on like who who's the stranger who is sauron what, what nobody knows what's going on i, I like this I, i'm really enjoying the 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 ride and let's hope it ends well i suppose <laughs> you're the same johnny yeah I, I i agree with pretty much all of that uh definitely i i just feel excited every time i'm i'm tuning into a new episode so that's uh if a show gives you that feeling then that's i think a good thing and yeah, it, like it's not without its flaws. Uh, I'm not going to just give it blind praise, but in general, I'm I'm quite happy with most of it so far. Again, I really hope they stick the landing for the end of season one because 
I don't want to have two years of being frustrated at a, a poor ending of a, of a series. I want it to, you know, just have a big finish uh, for us Stick all to be line. relatively happy and be and like kind of go, okay, well, I like what they've done with the lore here. Maybe what they, the you know, especially the kind of thing with the um the the whole mithril thing and getting bathed in mithril all that kind of stuff i'm sure maybe we'll talk about that later but uh, i hope that gets kind of resolved and um we find out what's going on what's going on there and yeah but um i'm really looking forward to the final two episodes i can't believe we're nearly there already yeah it's gone by quite quick i mean before we get into questions i got from my patrons as always i'm going to frame this around questions i've got from my patrons i i'd love to just get your feel for something that I've been mulling over this last week, which is the um, the overall structure of the season. The way that they've delivered this is that they broadly they've broadly had these sort of four big plot lines. We've had sort of the elves and the dwarves. We've had the stranger with the Harfoots. We've had the Numenor slash Galadriel slash Halbrand plot, and then the Southlands plot uh, with Adar. And all of them have had a mystery that seems to have been the way that they've gone with this then ending up with um presumably they're going to be, reveal what's been going on all of this time we had a bit of that last episode uh with uh, that's so this is what the mysterious and uh, sinister sword is all about uh presumably at some point we'll get this is what's going on with hellbrand this is what's going on with uh the stranger how do you are you enjoying that approach because they could have done this in a number of different ways but this is clearly a decision to to make this a a mystery with a reveal at the end john do you want to take this um sure uh well i don't know i I mean that's what i'm saying i hope they stick the landing because for uh, so far i think there's been maybe too many things up in the air i think maybe they've uh now one of my theories is that they're trying to please the book readers and the people that know all of the lore to try and give us something to you know to keep us guessing basically because i mean if you're a person that's gone in and you don't know anything about lord of the rings or you don't know anything about the rings of power or what's going on in, in tolkien's world i'm sure you just be entertained by normal plots and storylines but i think they wanted to, to try and you know appeal to uh everybody including the people that are you know the nerds online like us that love the lore and i think maybe the result could have been almost the opposite where people get really frustrated that they're saying that that's not the way it's supposed to be and so i think maybe that could have backfired but again I, that's maybe just one kind of theory that i think may have been the case but in terms of the um the mysteries again some of them are quite fun as well to to keep guessing about who we think uh halbrand is or who do we think sauron's going to be uh, is Halron, is is he going to be Sauron? Who's the who's the the stranger going to be? And I think I really assume that by the end of season one, we're going to have the answers to at least one, if not both, of those questions. I suppose. I I don't know. How would you feel, Robert, if we finished season one not knowing who Sauron was going to be? I mean, would you be really annoyed? Would you be okay with it? It's, I suppose it depends on where we finish the season because. Yeah if we get to the point where the rings are about to be forged and there's no Sauron on the horizon then or Anatar, Mm. then yes, I would get frustrated. What, what the showrunners have said ages ago when they were setting all this is that they wanted season one to be getting the world or showing how this world could reach the point at which everyone could be deceived and the rings of power could be forged. So that's their concept for season one, as it were. Now, that's fine. But for me, that means you have to have Sauron somehow behind the scenes, pulling the strings, doing something. And I think they have to show us that because there are so many different things. We'll pick up on these in different um, uh, bits of when we're sort of going through the different elements of plot. But there are so many things that you just go, okay, so why is there that three month deadline on having to make that great big forge there must be something going on there uh mm. who were who were those uh, strange priest people who seem to be trying to find the stranger that there, there's uh, what's with what's in the pouch that hellbrand sure. has there are lots of even smaller not even the big questions but smaller mm. questions that they have to give us some of this some of them okay can carry on but they have to be giving us some of those or it will just feel unfulfilled filling i mean yeah. dave have you got any thoughts on this sort of overall structure 
Yeah, well, first, just to talk about the whole Sauron thing and if he'll be revealed at the end of the season. Mm. I think I remember way back before there was any material that was released at all. And they talked about how the first season will be a lot of lore building. It'll be getting you back familiar with Middle Earth again. And I remember thinking, okay, maybe we mightn't even get a mention of Sauron until the last episode of the first season. But we saw from the trailers, uh, Galadriel men- mentioned Sauron. And I think she's, she mentions him in like near the start of the first episode. So once she's mentioned him and he's been kind of a running theme throughout, he has to be revealed at the end of the season. Mm. Yeah. That would just be mm. ridiculous. But um, yeah, on the actual structure of season one, I think it is interesting, and I don't want to always be comparing the Rings of Power to House of the Dragon or Game of Thrones, but Jeff Bezos was the one that said he wanted the Rings of Power to be like um, the next Game of Thrones. And in terms of the actual structure of the show, it, it is similar to the earlier seasons of Game of Thrones, how they would just have different locations and none of them would connect at all. So you have scenes in King's Landing, then you'd have The Wall, then you'd have Winterfell. And they just wouldn't connect at all, but you're just following all these different stories for whatever reason. There might be a mystery or you just you're just following because you you love the show. And interestingly, they started to culminate together or join up. Characters would die or characters would come together in later seasons, six, seven, eight. And by season eight, there was basically Winterfell and King's Landing. And then eventually the stories all emerged into one. Now, we've already seen that happen in the Rings of Power with the Southlanders and the Numenorians, their their stories have intertwined together. And I think this is the kind of structure that they're hoping to go with, where they're just going to start merging the stories together. And we've already seen that with two plots. So, um, yeah, uh, that's what I think they're going for. They're what? doing it a lot earlier than Game of Thrones did because it's already season one and they're merging. But that's my opinion on it. Do you guys have any opinion on whether or not there could be a, sort of a Witcher kind of thing going on where... There's uh, different timelines and how um, the elves and the dwarves timeline is different to the Southlanders timeline and that kind of a thing. Does any... I I had thought thought about that, yeah. Yeah. Because I think... I I mean, I don't know how... I mean, I don't know if that would even add that much to the story, but I think it could be a thing where we realise that uh, we see the creation of Mordor and then I think maybe the next episode is going to open up. We're going to see Mordor has been created. Maybe... Whoever Sauron is, possibly Halbrand, has disappeared. And then we could realize that there's actually now I, I imagine that the big event that's gonna call that's gonna um like uh, end up in us needing to create these rings is gonna be the the what we saw in episode five, which is the elves imagining that they're gonna they have this for some reason three month or whatever is before next spring, they have this deadline that okay, we're gonna be fading, which seems like a very short period of time that they're gonna fade in. And I don't know what what kind of uh, Keller Brimbor, I'm not sure what, who he has in his science lab that he's there, like <laughs> deciding that it's going to be okay. Spring, I reckon that's exactly going to be the date that we're going to start fading. But that seems to be that that is the big event that they have this fear that they need to have these rings made or something like that in order to stop um, this fading from happening. And I think maybe we could find out that basically uh, Sauron could be the person who, after Mordor has been created, then it shifts like a couple of years into the future and he is the one who's been pulling the strings behind that as well with Celebrimbor in a, like, that's one possibility as well. But again, I, as I said, I don't know if that really adds to the story or have you... Uh, have the you the, the only problem that? there though is that we've seen Galadriel in both in both plots, in both mm. storylines. Oh, so okay. Galadriel has right. already been in Lindy. Off the table, so never mind. Well, like, <laughs> who knows? Maybe there was like a massive time jump from when Galadriel left on the ships to Valinor and there's a big time jump to the next time we see Lyndon again. That's m- maybe the only way you could squeeze it in, but I don't know how they would do that in two episodes. I mean, or... you, yeah, you you could. Um, you could say, okay, the, the scenes that we had of them all seeing the comet that, you know, they, they were out of chronological order um, mm. in the show. You could say that scene where Keller Brimbor appears, that actually didn't happen when it looked like it happened just after the Galadriel thing it actually happened. But I, for me, that would be just pushing it a bit too much. Mm. Um, and I don't think it's necessary uh, as yeah. well. I, I don't think that they would actually... Um, 
gain or the plot would gain anything from that. So something like Westworld season one, I don't know whether you guys watched that. I was a massive fan. I think it's one of the yeah, best seasons of TV we've had. Westworld season one, I think, nailed how you do that to the point where actually when you get the reveal, it's, oh, yeah, now I understand everything that's been going on and I can fit it all in together and I understand why they showed us like that because thematically you wish to echo certain different characters' journeys that worked. This, I can't see any uh, structural benefit for it. Sure. Um, it can, if I can bring it back, the, 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 sort of, the reason why I was asking this was that the thing that I've been mulling over is that this... A concept of we're having stories and then there's going to be a, a mystery and a big reveal at the end of the season. That's not how Tolkien wrote. And that's the the bit that I all the way through this, I've had a thing at the back of my head. I was saying, why does this not feel like a Tolkien story in the sense that there are many elements here that do feel like a Tolkien story? We get friendship, love, and the warmth, the other hope, all of that. There's lots of good stuff in there. But structurally, that's not how Tolkien ever wrote. You get The Hobbit, you get The Lord of the Rings, both of them, basically Gandalf comes along and says, and here's the plot, and here's everything there is, and here's the stakes, and this is this is the adventure we need to go on. Right in chapter two, pretty much, both times. But here, no, we don't have that. And that, I think, is a different way of telling a story. Now, hmm. that has its good points, it has its bad points, but I think it's just worth at the very least noting that this isn't how Tolkien would have revealed this story. He would have just gone through from beginning to end. Um, and as he did in the Silmarillion or Christopher edited it, it was like, and then he took on a, a, a body of fair hue as Anatar and went off and tried to deceive people. He mm. just said that up, up mm. front. So we would, he would have had it with this, here's Sauron. Now we're seeing him changing into Anatar, and now he's heading off doing this thing. So we, the audience, can come with it. Um, so I've got a rant in there somewhere because I think that there's a lot of knock-on effects of that decision. Well, I, 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 I do think a... it's a necessary sacrifice uh, and a decision that the showrunners had to make to television and books. Mm. It's impossible to have a straight adaptation. So you're going to have to have something to... Well, obviously, Amazon really want to appeal to mainstream audiences and take audiences from Game of Thrones, from Harry Potter, from, you know, just other people that don't really watch anything. So they want to gather as much as they can. So the only way you can do that is with these kind of mysteries and intrigue and showing us trailers of who's this guy that came from the comets. And maybe they go online to look at YouTubers like ourselves and yourself. and <laughs> We don't even know. And that like makes the intrigue even more in in that favor so i don't know i just think that there's no way you could have directly done the silmarillion or the second age uh, and just made a tv show out of it and kept it interesting so yeah i think i agree and um oliver in the chat saying uh, definitely not tolkien in the way it's laid out but i honestly don't mind i think this works as a modern tv adaptation so yeah i mean mm. this isn't a critique from me so much as it's an yeah. observation um that I, and for what it's worth, I think once they've decided to do that structure, if you've created a mystery or a set of mysteries, I think they've done that well. And to the extent that we're here six of eight episodes in, and we'll come on to this in a moment, I'm sure, but I, I was just on Twitter after episode six, and half of the people said, well, that's uh, shown us that Halbrand definitely isn't Sauron, and the other half <laughs> of people saying, oh, this is more evidence that the Halbrand is Sauron, and I think that it, on something as, as fundamental as that, if we're still trying to figure out what's going on, then they've delivered that structure uh, quite effectively. Hmm. Um, yes, but opinion. they'd still need to give us reasons for if he is going to be Sauron, they need to give us reasons for the little hints that he's dropped that he wasn't Sauron and then vice versa. Yeah. Because exactly, I, yeah. I still think like he could be both and I want to know reasons why he is or he isn't. They can't just be like, yeah, he is this and he's been this the whole time. I, I need to know. Hmm. I, like I won't be satisfied until I'm given a proper, proper answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm firmly in the camp that uh, Halbrand is Sauron. But then again, I agree completely that there's been little hints that he's not. And I'm not sure if that's like, oh, maybe he isn't. It's, it hasn't changed my mind. All it's done is made me think, 
I think the showrunners are just putting things in to try and throw us off the trail. And some of them are kind of maybe can work in the story. Like he has these kind of conversations with Galadriel and you feel like, oh, maybe he's, is he being earnest or is he just saying this to try and trick her? And that could be cool. But there's a, like, for example, there was the one part where he, he left his little pouch on the table as if he wasn't going to go. And then he kind of came back and grabbed it at the last minute and he did go. And it's like, there was no one there. So that was only done for the benefit of the viewers. So what does that kind of mean? Maybe is Sauron, if he is Sauron, what's happened? What happened in that moment? Was he actually having a moment of doubt? And maybe was that like, is he in his kind of moment of repentance and he's actually true repentance? Because again, I don't believe that when Sauron actually did repent, uh, I don't think it was ever genuine. I think it was just out of fear of the Valar. So um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what, what's your what's your opinion on that, Robert? Uh, well, on that specific point, uh, I tend to the view if this is if this is Sauron, then I think they are going to give us a Sauron. And I don't know whether repentance is the right um, w- sort of word for this, but the way that for this to be Sauron, the way that they have to have set this up is that Sauron, he thinks that he's in the right. Everyone's a hero of their own story. He thinks that he's in the right. He's trying to get this world to be ordered. He's trying mm. to, uh, he thinks he's the best person to be controlling it. He thinks that he can tr- do some magic to to, to make the world, a, a Middle Earth, a, a bigger, better place. Um, then he has the Orc Rebellion and gets killed. Um but he's a Maya, so it doesn't matter. And then he comes back as Halbrand. And he's off being, uh, having this crisis of confidence. I th- That's probably where, how I put it, rather than uh, repentance, a crisis of confidence, is that he doesn't want to go back because he thinks that I, you know, his people turned against him. And having got this uh, persona as the rightful king of the southlands he's like then debating whether or not he actually does want to go through with this plan that he had so Mm. that it would be quite a big move from the showrunners if they did go down this route that you do have sauron as this exactly lacking confidence (laughs) in some way um Mm. they have they exactly they 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 have a lot to land in these last two episodes and it's not just things like, but as you say, there are so many questions that we've got. We, we need to get to the bottom of the um, elves bathing in mithril nonsense. We need to get to the bottom of what's going on with the stranger. We need to get to the bottom of what's happening with Hellbrand. There's a lot of things that we just need to really get mm. answers to. And that has to all happen in a satisfactory way within the next two hours of TV. Sure, but let's go to some questions from my patrons. Uh, this is re- I found that fascinating sort of uh, overall discussion of, of what we've got going on here. Um, Alejandro Martinez saying hello, Robert. I thought this past episode was one of the best ones yet, and I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to where they take the stories next. So, how did the Numenorians know where to go? It seems like they found that little village pretty easily. Now, uh, I I think this was a a thing in the previous episode when they called Halbrand into that mini council and said, where would you think that we should go? And he sort of like points right under like that <laughs> spot in the mountains <laughs> there. Uh, and they go, okay then. Um, and they, I mean, I think the cavalry charge across a, a, a sort of like what looks like a valley way before they needed to be charging to go into combat that was just for cinematic reasons mm, but mm. um it was i think what they're trying to say was that he halbrand either if he is sauron knew or if he's not sauron he's a bit of a military genius what's what's your sort of take on that were you okay with that idea of how they got there yeah i was fine um, with it i i think um again probably the biggest stronghold in that area was that sort of tower area with the big dam. So, Mm. I mean, that would be the logical bit. Now, I know that this town wasn't exactly, but it was the closest town to that. So maybe they were charging towards that uh, tower and then just, they happened to pass by the village and they're like, oh, there they are. But again, just to kind of move the plot along, I didn't, 
there's there are numbers a, a number of things like that that you kind of you could sit and nitpick and kind of go that doesn't make sense but i'm not gonna make that take away from my enjoyment of it but i did think that it was a bit strange to see the horses and the cavalry in full gallop when they clearly were you know maybe maybe they were an hour away at that point they were just charging mm. and i'm wondering how exhausted must those horses have been when they eventually <laughs> arrived at the destination so um maybe they just knew that they really needed to as um muriel said we need to make haste and uh, there, there there wasn't a, a moment to spare so they just really pushed their horses to the limit the entire um march whatever that was not march uh, it was a gallop really for maybe the whole like i don't know how many hours of uh horseback ride that was but um yeah long story short it didn't phase me too much it was a little bit you know uh coincidental but um as i said hal branch knows the lands well and that was probably the most logical point with the big tower and dam area i'd say it was the chance meeting uh between the horses and the orcs <laughs> yeah no i i completely agree i didn't think about it at the time and in fact last week on on our own show we were discussing more so how did they get there so soon it, it seemed like they we we knew that they were arriving at middle earth at dawn i believe and then we saw them charging when it seemed to be just before dawn so it looks like it took them a whole 24 hours to get to the southlands so that's fair enough but we don't know how tied halbrand is to these villagers or you know maybe he's from a different village we don't really know what what the crack is there. So um, perhaps they had gone to lots of other villages and saw they're empty and they're like, OK, let's keep going until we until we find these orcs. And um, I don't know, like at the end of the day, it's just it's just plot device. Um, it could be Galadriel elven magic. Just just saying could be that. Um, it could have been nice but, to get like a like a few second shots of them, even just disembarking from the boats like we've we've we're, mm -hmm. we're on land now. Get on the horses, start making our way just because we kind of forgot all about the Numenorians, even because what, first of all, they were they had a full day's uh, boat ride ahead of them, and then another like half a day's march or something, and then we just don't see them again until they're they're like oh they're they're arriving on the doorstep now. So I thought it might have been nice to kind of break up that long journey with just okay we've, we're now we've touched base we're on land and now we're making our we're you know we're we're changing the horses and we're going, but that might have helped us to realize the you know the the timing of things and the distance and stuff but um also how i'm not sure get, how to get through the mountains as well um i never really thought about that because like isn't it supposed to be completely barricading around mordor unless you know unless halbrand yeah. is sauron and when he forges the one ring and he creates you know lands and and structures kind of like he created baradur maybe he uses that to fill in the gaps between the mountains and create Mordor as more of a fortress. So yeah, I mean there is a there is a pass. Also, you get um, what becomes Minas Ithil, Minas Morgul. That is yeah, clearly there is a way through in some way. But so, but I mean, for this horses, is, yeah. I mean, I don't know. This is this yeah, is like, um. It's, it's just completely uh, brushed over, I suppose. Yeah, my 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 general take on this, and probably the thing we're about to talk about in a moment, is it's just this was to make it look cool, and I mm -hmm. I can kind of forgive some. Let's just make it look cool. They 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 arrived in the nick of time. Um, how they knew to be there at just that moment again is another issue. But mm. um, yes, yeah, so, so I think we just would like um suspend our disbelief for that one. Uh, but we've got a, another, uh, Alejandro also asked about um, uh, how two battle-tested warriors like Galadriel and Arondir didn't realise that the hilt wrapped in the cloth wasn't a hilt but an axe. Um, yeah. Especially Arondir, he had held the broken blade. Um, as soon as Theo took hold of the wrapped bundle, he immediately knew it was wrong. Is this a plot device? Um, so, I mean, is this another thing like that? It's just... Convenient. I mean, I think Galadriel wasn't told this is a sword hilt. She was yeah, just exactly. told whatever is in that bundle is important. So I think we can probably forgive her for that. And she seems to have had that for the most of that period of time, just handing it on. So, but is mm. this just a, a convenient plot device to move it along? Yeah, I think so. I, like, it is kind of funny. It would have been even funnier if they put. I don't know, a big round ball in there and he was just <laughs> carrying, Aaron Deere was carrying this round ball even though he knows it's supposed to be a little hilt. But yeah, um, 
it's a similar shape. It's really tightly wrapped, or sorry, not tightly wrapped, but there seems to be a lot of kind of you know packaging. stuff in between. Yeah, a lot of packaging <laughs> basically there. Amazon packaging. And um, yeah, you can kind of forgive him that if he gets it for two seconds, he's just going to assume that it, it hasn't been given the old switcheroo. But um, yeah, I don't know. Aaron Deere, like he's not he's not really on the ball in this episode at all. And uh, I'm just hoping this isn't the last time we see the hilt as well on a, on a separate note, because I was hoping that there was going to be something very special with it that, you know, it's not just a, a MacGuffin or a, a doohickey item that's used to unlock a dam basically um like you know it drinks blood and it forms <laughs> into an actual sword and it's supposed to be special like anyone could have had an mm. actual key to unlock a dam and the dam doesn't seem to have anything to do with mordor or the creation of mount doom or sorry the cre- yeah the creation of mordor it's just all it did was release a dam and that could have been used for anything so i don't know the the hilt yeah. thing i hope there is more to it but uh, mm. what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it was just hello, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I, I actually thought that, uh, as you said, Dave, as well, it was a similar shape. I mean, the little hatchet mm. uh, axe kind of thing that was in there. Um, if you go back and watch it again, the hilt only has one side that actually has the kind of a uh, hand protector thing on it as well. So it did have a similar shape. It was definitely like not a bad idea of an object to put in to have a similar shape to the hilt of the sword. And as you said, it was kind of wrapped quite a few times. So um, I, I mean, again, that didn't bother me that much. And what I think in the question, he said something like um, when th- what, what was the question? He said when Theo got it, he knew immediately he was off. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know if I agree with that either. I think that Theo was holding it. And the reason he opened it was because he wanted to have another look at the hilt is what I, yeah. what I was getting from it. So I don't know, like I, from, I've I watched it too. a couple of times. And what the, from the feeling I got was Theo didn't realize that something was off. He got it and he was like trying to like the look on his face was, am I going to give this back to the Numenorians or am I sorry, going to give it to the Numenorians in order to throw it into the sea? And I'm at least going to get one more look at it, almost like Pippin trying to get one more look at the Palantir. Um, yeah. Kind of like, let me just see it one more time at least. And... So, I uh, yeah, I would maybe disagree with that in the question that I don't think he knew what was up immediately. I think I think that's right as far as I'm concerned as well. It's it's one of the things about that sword that I liked was what it felt like. It was a sort of show don't tell kind of thing, but it felt like it was Theo always wanted to take it out and look at it in the same way that mm. Bilbo always wanted to take the ring out and look at it. It's just. Um, mm. And and that worked for me really well. This idea then that when he got it back and basically he's told by Alan Deere, right, what you now need to do is give it away to someone. What does he actually want to do? Is he wants to look at it. So mm. that worked really well for me. I I didn't have a problem with that uh, at all. I have to say, uh, we will talk about Theo a bit later because um, what his character arc is going to be, I think, is is one of the things that's not just for this season, but longer, mm. I think, is going to be quite a fascinating one. Just, just, um, to, Ella, just to jump in on. on that, sorry for one second, Robert, just uh, the one other thing that was interesting was the fact that when uh, he was given back the what he thought was the, the hilt at the time, it would have been interesting because in that moment we would have seen a good development of his character, whether or not he chose to give it back to the Numenorians, uh, or if they ended up having to kind of take it and force it off him again. But mm. he didn't get to make like I mean that could have been if he actually gave it up, and like gave away uh, the hilt that like had you know that kind of sort of hold on him. It would have maybe kind of broken that uh, possible path that he's on down kind of a dark path sort of. It might have been a kind of a, a healing moment for him. But the fact that he actually didn't get that opportunity to even make that decision, well then it was he didn't get to have that moment where he could have possibly uh, turned off this path that he might be currently going down. Convenient. Yeah. Um, Andrew Kay in the chat saying, with the new Minorians saving the day, they needed a bit more build up and discussing intelligence gathered or something, not just let's check out this veil. Uh, yeah, I think I would agree with that. Alejandro um, said, uh, as a sort of a follow up to this, um, w- wouldn't this all be more evidence of the Hellbrand equals Sauron? is that he arrived at Numenor with Galadriel, and Miriel said that Galadriel's arrival signalled Numenor's downfall, but she did not arrive alone. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's very true. We'll get on to the uh, Hellron, Hellron conspiracy theories in a little bit, um, <laughs> but I think that's definitely another little minor thing to pick up on. 
Um, while we're on the sort of the the, the details of this, I mean, these are good details of, of the episode. Diego Godoy says, Hola, Robert, hola. Uh, was Aaron Deer really willing to let the orcs kill Bronwyn to protect the sword? Um, I don't know. Dave, do you want to just uh, pick up on that one? Yeah. Um, again, while this was playing out, I, I just kind of felt like it's one of those scenarios that we see in film and TV that somebody has to be the hero and the other has to be the villain. Uh, I could easily imagine roles, of, well, maybe not roles to reverse, but if there was another character that was giving up the hilt to Adar, um, Arendir could be playing the one that's like, no, don't do it. Or, or no, sorry, that, that is what he's doing. He could have been yeah. the one giving up the, the hilt while somebody else is saying, no, don't do it. So um, I just think it's it's just one of those things. He was trying to be the hero for the show. I don't think he was really thinking like, yeah, kill Bronwyn, but he was just thinking, like, I've been trying to protect these lands my whole life, and now this dumbass 16-year-old kid <laughs> is just gonna give, give it all up for some mortal woman. No, no, he didn't think that at all, but, you know, uh, I did find it a little funny, almost saying, like, no, dude, like, just let them kill your mother, but then, luckily, we didn't get to see how it played out, because there was, a, again, another chance meeting of the Numenorians arriving. In fact, I think I heard the Tolkien professor calling it a was it a U catastrophe, which is like U a catastrophe, Tolkien, yeah, yeah, mm. Tolkien coined word for like basically a sudden turn of events that's not altogether bad. So that was a um, positive yeah, catastrophe, a positive catastrophe. Hmm. I mean, this I liked... is the word he used for the eagles, incidentally, when, when he's saying this is the role that they have is a U catastrophe. They mm. arrived just in the nick of time every time and that's like yeah. a, a wonderful uh, blessed thing that happens that's going to be my excuse yeah. for everything that happens in the show now that's uh, when we kind of go how did the Numenorians know to be there exactly on time it was a you catastrophe it was yeah, <laughs> from Tolkien yeah exactly <laughs> But, yeah, but the point is that with the the eagles, then Tolkien was very clear that he did not wish to overuse that. Um, sure. Because, sure. I mean, even the amount of times he did it, then everyone says, well, why not use the eagles to do this? Why not? And and he was very clear that you shouldn't because that would that would yeah. diminish the value of having a new catastrophe because it should yeah. be something yeah. unexpected. And if you're always expecting things to turn out perfectly well, then mm. it's, it's no enough. longer that. Yeah, we kind of spoke in our in our last podcast about how um, there were quite a lot of things in this episode that it was just like just in the nick of time, like and not just in this episode, actually in the in the whole sh show so far, like Theo is about to get killed or is at least his arm cut off, and Arondir shows up just in the nick of time and saves him. And in in this episode alone, there was uh, Halbrand's about to kill Adar, Galadriel in the nick of time stops him, and vice versa. Then Halbrand stops Galadriel killing. Uh, Adar and then the Numenor is showing up there was a lot of this just and again um, uh, Bronwyn saving Arondir just in the nick of time as well there was mm. so many of that, that happening it was a little bit overused almost and people can say people can throw it back to the two towers and say well what about um, Gandalf arriving uh, just in the nick of time as well and I think that there's a big difference between those different situations first of all it wasn't so overused in the Lord of the Rings and secondly and a wizard showing up just in the nick of time and we know that wizards arrive precisely when they mean to and he had he had also told uh, aragorn to look for his coming so i think there's definitely more reason why we can see the legitimacy of gandalf's arrival just in the nick of time as opposed to maybe the numenorian one or the other ones that i mentioned before so again it's a typical kind of um television trope that's used but hopefully they'll start to use it not so often because as you said the more you use it the more it kind of just takes away from the the, the power the and the and the, yeah the stakes as well because you start to just stop believing that any anybody's going to be injured at all and uh, again as we saw Gandalf showing up in the nick of time yeah in the nick of time but also a lot of people had died um, Aldir, Aldir had, had died, died yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know so there were the stakes were high and it wasn't just I'm just going to show up and everybody's fine so um, it's not quite the same in in that kind of context no and uh, I I think. One other, just while we're on that sort of battle, one other thing I'm I'm keen for them to do is to restore what I thought they did really well in the first few episodes, which was making orcs scary again. 
which all the way through the Peter Jackson films, we just got used to orcs are just red shirts mm. of the bad guys' side. Um, they You throw them at the heroes and the heroes kill them. Here, what they did when they had you know, the orc in the kitchen, the things like that, orcs suddenly appeared to be quite fearsome. Now we've had a battle and they just got wiped out pretty much straight away. So what I want is for them to regain that kind of uh, scariness that they definitely mm. started injecting into them in this show. Um, but a question which I have to admit, I, I thought about quite a lot when I was trying to work my way through exactly what happened last episode. Uh, my TFAM saying, uh, I love the theory that Hellbrand is Sauron, but the intricacies of what he would have to do to know all these pieces could fall as he saw fit. Are the show trying to show us, maybe, that there is an element of chaos to this? Was Adar simply carrying out the Mordor formation plan that Sauron and others knew about? Um, so this this is, uh, if you don't mind me reframing the, the, the question, my TFAM, is... How? What exactly was the iteration of events here? Uh, was the 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 sword, which was the releasing the dam, letting the waters come out, was that always a part of a plan from Sauron to be able to get the mountain to blow up? In which case, why weren't those tunnels there already? Was Adar aware that this was going to happen and he then wanted to come in and, and make those tunnels to divert the water to where he wanted it to be? What What's your, uh, Johnny, maybe you can start on this one. What's your take on exactly what was going on there? Who who made what and when? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a big question. Um well, I think we know that, first of all, the fortress that was in place, that that was originally, I think it, it exchanged hands like maybe three times where it was the original forces of the people that lived there who became loyal to Morgoth. Then it got taken over by the elves. And then now it's back with um, this these town people as well. So um, the, the dam that had been created was obviously created by the, 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 the people that were living there, the Southlanders that were originally loyal to Morgoth. Maybe that was you know for that purpose maybe they had they they did they built that dam in order for it to be open that would make sense why there is this strange key that unlocks the whole dam uh that like that would need to be built in when it's being created in the first place i don't think you could uh, add in that secret little mm. hatch uh hatch door later on so um i think this seems to have been a plan that was uh, a long time in the making and Possibly when we saw the 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 little, was it in episode three, I believe? Or maybe it was, uh, yeah, no, I think it was in episode three when we see um, Galadriel going to the, the, the House of Lore or whatever it was called. And she finds that note that was kind of like a little message that Sauron had left for people that like that was to, to go north and to do this. Maybe there had been other messages that Sauron had just been kind of leaving around the place of what his plan was going to be and what he was kind of hoping to do and maybe if Adar did know Sauron and as he says he not only did he meet him but he says that he's claiming that he's killed him um he obviously could have had conversations with Sauron and know that this was the plan and I don't know if Sauron he must have studied chemistry in school that he knew that adding <laughs> water into a, a volcano was going to create this kind of seismic boom um so that's uh, pretty smart on his part so um but I, I imagine it must have been the plan all along. Um, and then it was just a matter of timing. It was a matter of, okay, whenever we want to enact our plan, these tunnels need to be dug. And um, I mean, if the tunnels are left there for, if they, if they get dug way before, like centuries before they plan to actually create or to have this uh, volcanic eruption, then maybe there's a chance for um, people to discover these tunnels, maybe possibly work out what their plan is. So I think... It makes sense to dig the tunnels just before you want to open up that water and let it flow in. So, um, but it's not something that I've actually put too much thought into. So that's <laughs> the, the musings off the top of my head. So there you go. Hope that made sense. I think it did. Dave, have you got anything to add to that one? Yeah, like this is one of the things that confuses me the most about the show. Like I really do hope that there is more to it than, than meets the eye because if Halbrand is to be Sauron, then it doesn't seem like there's any method to his madness at all. Um, and I really hope that the show isn't 
just showing us Sauron starting to turn evil after trying to repent because like we've said already that is a possibility but the whole tunnels thing and the dam thing I just I just don't find it believable like any any act of God or any act of of uh, nature could have damaged the dam and you know release the water or you know there could have been a drought or maybe or an end an angry end or an end yeah like it just <laughs> it's just kind of random like this whole plan was built on just like this little dam um and then this really evil sword that unlocked it it's just i don't know something's off for me um i hope that's mm. that's not what the whole plan was uh i think yeah, i wasn't just i wasn't like, a, i wasn't a big fan of the sword the whole sword being the key when i heard that when they, i think somebody said it was a key in the previous episode and i was uh-huh. like please let there be a metaphorical key and not an actual <laughs> liter- literal key. So um, I have to say, I didn't really enjoy that moment. But again, it was one second where I was like, oh, I don't know if I like that. And then two minutes later, I was just like enthralled by this visual uh, masterpiece that I was watching on my TV of actually the creation of Mordor. So I forgot about it quite instantly. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the actual creation of Mordor was, well, it was class. Like the actual look of the water going in and blending with mm. the magma and then the eruption it was just unbelievable it was uh unbelievable sin yeah i think it looked amazing i think that's the, the the main but thing at, we uh, um, I've, 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 <laughs> sorry sorry, sorry Dave, I, I you, you broke up for just one minute so i just jumped in um <laughs> so um I, my my feeling is that the sword was sauron's that that's that's what I I think we put. It has it's got its mark on it, and then uh, Waldreg also says, you know, he made it for us. So it's like he made mm. it by his own hand. So this was mm. him, and presumably, therefore, the idea that this was releasing the water must also have been Sauron's plan. And apparently, he was leaving those marks to get all of the the baddies to congregate there. So presumably, he wanted the orcs to be ending up in Mordor. So I I think my best understanding is that yeah as you say that Adar must have known about this plan and the only bit that was missing was those tunnels and also the sword he didn't know where the sword was but he knew roughly where the sword was so he came in and finished off the plan that Sauron had come up with whenever this was Mm, um I don't know. What, it, it's, what it's, do you think is better? What do you what do you think is a better idea? That now we've seen the creation of Mordor. Do you think it's cool that we saw it being created in a scientifically accurate way, where this like uh, infusion of water into an active volcano would have caused this, or would you have loved to have just seen Sauron in all his might standing on the edge of Mount Doom and with you know um, dark clouds overhead, and he's just there muttering and uh, magically <laughs> creating uh, Mordor? Would that have been a really cool visual as well? <laughs> It would have been. I mean, what my my theory, and and I'm I'm probably going to start getting flack for getting theories wrong soon because uh, I've I've put some theories out there quite early on. But my theory, which I still quite like, I, I to be honest, I prefer my version. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, was that the uh, when you looked at the wall carving, the sword was being plunged into a person. And I thought, ah, this must be a magic thing. You need a sacrifice. That's what the sword is for. And you kill somebody. But who is it who is powerful mm. enough for that sacrifice to be worthwhile? Well, the stranger's heading roughly that direction. <laughs> and I thought, I thought the stranger was going to be a Belrog. I'm now kind of uh, winding myself back from that one. I don't think <laughs> the stranger is a Belrog. Uh, I liked the idea. But uh, then I thought, well, that would be perfect because if you get a Belrog, all of that fire stuff going on, mm-hmm. you sacrifice a Belrog, big explosion. This is how you create Mount Doom. Mount Do- Doom is created by a Belrog worked wow. for me and sort of deep, dark magic. So I liked that idea that it's sort of you understand it logically, but it's also magical. Um, the we're using sort of uh, science in order to do this. I, it kind of fits with Sauron in a way, I guess, in that he obviously will understand about water and and fire if he works in forges and things like that. So yes, I guess that that would all add up. And as you say, it looked amazing. I don't know. I liked my theory. Let's mm, let's leave it. Yeah. Like it it, it did seem that. strange, though. It did seem very strange that it seemed like the carving on the wall clearly showed the sword being 
stabbed through an, a person and it looked like it was some sort of a, uh, like an area where a sacrifice would take place. So it was a bit unusual that it was just like, oh no, you just stick the, store, stick the sword in the, in the little slot and that's it. Yeah, I, mean, I had the sword uh, needs blood to, to actually yes, be a sword. Yes, yes. I mean, I had Kelly Rice on from Happy Hobbit last week, and I I gave her this grand theory, and she <laughs> said that her interpretation was actually that is just more a sort of a symbolic thing that you might wish to show in ancient carvings from many different civilizations. You're showing that you're in charge, you're defeating your enemies, you show a, show a picture mm. of somebody being killed by a sword. That's all she thought it was. And it turns out I think she was right there. Um, um, and it never. was just me over-interpreting, or yeah. literally interpreting what I saw yeah. on that wall. Um, which, okay, I mean, it's it's, it's fine. It, it as it looked good, and I liked the fact that even though it doesn't necessarily completely line up with the, all of the Mordor history that Tolkien gave us, I like the idea that it was created um, around that sort of time. Mm. Uh, creative also, branches, I, would like hope- to, I would like to point out that for some reason, uh, Sauron's mask on that on that wall looks the image of General Grievous from Star Wars. So um, <laughs> if anybody else... I thought the same thing well then (laughs) yeah I I was I was planning during the week to make a meme about it but I just didn't have time so uh, yeah maybe somebody else could do that for me no we'll we'll get it out there Many talented artists in the chat, so mm. may, maybe somebody will uh, will come up with that. They, um, uh, someone I'm not going to name any names, but someone did after we were talking about Balrogs with penguin wings uh, on a previous live stream, <laughs> did in fact come up with a picture of a Balrog with a penguin Excellent. wings. So um, uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Anyway, um, Creative Branches, hopefully that answered your question as well about whether Sauron commissioned to the dam or built it himself. Did the elves build the uh, uh, the things on the top? I think. I think hopefully we've now um, sort of answered all of that. You did ask about how Adar escaped from being tied up. I didn't personally think, I went back and had a look at it. He is still chained up in that last scene we see when he's sort of putting his head down on the floor. He is still chained. He just sort of like gets himself down onto the ground level. And incidentally, I think this opens up the possibility that he may have survived. Um, he could, I think we get a well, shot of of him having escaped, though. I think we get a shot of the empty barn. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, there's. Oh, I missed the, that completely. With the, with the, oh, the yeah. chains. The, he, he's 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 gone from the barn, and the chains are um, lying on the floor. So I think wow. we do get that. I actually missed it when I first saw it. I think I just saw an image of it online afterwards. So. I think that's what the question was was uh, asking about. Oh, well, that I'm glad I've got you on here with your eagle eyes. That's uh, exactly what I need. So, no, I know, I as I said, I missed it. <laughs> I'm, as I said, I missed it as well. I think somebody just like took a screenshot and shared it on Twitter. So that's where I saw it. And again, to answer the question, I think it's just there had been an enormous eruption just before that. So maybe the integrity of the beam it was attached to or something could have caused that uh, either the, the, the column or the pillar itself to become damaged or maybe even some sort of debris or something flew past and damaged the chain. I don't know. But again, in an eruption of that size, I'm sure anything can happen. And it, yeah, just again, maybe a plot device. But I, again, I didn't, I, I wouldn't see anything wrong with that either. The fact that he managed to escape um, in that moment. So No, I mean, when we get like fiery rocks coming down from the sky, yeah. just all it takes is one of them bashing its way into that barn and he could have escaped. So, um, yeah, I missed that completely, but um, it it works for me. Warren Cash saying, my wife is a volcanologist. There is no way that water from above would do anything like that, especially the shield volcano in the cave wouldn't affect Mount Doom. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to. Uh, my <laughs> expertise here is uh, mm-hmm. is rather limited. Let's put it that way. Um, I've I've heard from other volcanologists and geologists that actually that does work. Um, so I will let people draw their own conclusions. Um, not something I am personally an expert on. Oh, I will leave it. No, at yeah, it yeah. Look- I, I read during the week that it was some volcanologist just saying that basically the, it, it, it's a possibility, but it's not a certainty that basically the water has to come in and also block off the entrance that it's coming in at so that the the the, the basically no oxygen not just the oxygen but whatever um the, the sulfur and everything that's created in that mix can't escape through those little old holes where the water's coming in okay. so basically the water needs to pile in 
and there needs to only be one escape for the for it all to blow out from the top so again i think whoever i whichever scientist i read this from it was saying that it's he seemed to say like it's a possibility but it's not a probability maybe mainly okay I'll take it. well <laughs> dr yeah, again, johnny like, has spoken so we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we will we will go with that one um we're, we're an hour in which and what i normally do at this point is just to uh pause just to say thank you if you have been donating um, I hugely appreciate it. Um, uh, well, nearly four thousand nine hundred. If we could get to five thousand in this live stream, I would. I would be overjoyed. So, if you are enjoying this live stream, if you are enjoying the show, if you would like to show your uh, appreciation, the way I'm asking you to do it, if you are able, is to uh, donate uh, to Alzheimer's Care and Research. It's a, a hugely horrible disease. If you have ever come into contact with it, and if we can offer some care to those who are affected by it and fundamentally get the research in there to uh, to make sure that we can try and stop this in the future that would be amazing so thank you if you have uh, donated um and uh, if you are able i would hugely appreciate it if you do um also and thank you to you robert as well for oh, doing these live yes. streams it's um really really fantastic of you so really well done well uh, thank you very much it's it's, uh, it's one of those things that if if you're in the position to help out, then uh, then I think it's uh, it's a good thing. And if we can actually mm. save well, save some lives, actually make lives a little bit better, that's what we should be doing. So um, uh, thank you to I know lots of people have donated. So thank you to all of you, um, patrons as well. I just want to say thank you. I always say thank you to my patrons. Um, this is why I. Uh, frame my live streams around questions for my patrons because i hugely appreciate the support there if you would like to support the channel the best way to do that is through patreon there is a link down in the description and the last thing i want to say before we move on um is i've been forgetting to mention this all the way through um uh, this season but i've got a second channel i should probably tell you people about that um if you like audiobooks um if you want to hear me read audiobooks my second channel is called the well told tale uh, and i just read the best science fiction and fantasy stories ever written so if you'd love uh, call of cthulhu the war of the worlds all of the classics are there then do just go and check out the well told tale Okay, and with that, let's move on. We've still got, I've got a lot of questions here about this, obviously, what happened in the last episode all the way down in the Southlands. Um, question from Martin Sierstrand. Uh, I've probably mispronounced that. I do apologise, Martin. Saying, hi, Robert, what do you think of how Adar referred to Uru Iluvatar in the most recent episode? He said, we are creations of the one, master of the secret fire, the same as you. His reasoning is twisted, however, as orcs are clearly not made that way directly by Uru Iluvatar. I loved this conversation that they had, uh, Galadriel and Adar. And um, guys, I'll sort of come to you for thoughts in a moment. But what I what I will say is that this is, um, and I'm not the first person to notice this, I'm pretty sure this was deliberate on the showrunner's part. Tolkien changed his mind a lot about orcs, about the creation of orcs. There are at least five different versions of it that he came up with during his lifetime. The version that we have um, in the Silmarillion is basically they are these corrupted orcs. So Adar is basically that's what came up with there. But he, he was continually shifting his mind on quite theological grounds a lot of the time, which is where this comes down to. And what this ends up being is this almost like a conversation between two different versions of Tolkien uh, and at uh, different points in his life where we get Galadriel saying yeah all orcs are damned and have to be killed and then Adar saying well no but if they're alive then they have to have been to have that secret the secret fire in, within them coming from a Luvatar um, and that is if you read his letters on this, these are the kinds of debates that he has with himself. So I thought that was really interesting and, and one of the, the best moments in the show, as far as I'm concerned, of them actually engaging with Tolkien academia, uh, really. But what's what's your take on this one? Um, I don't know who wants to go. Uh, Dave, do you want to go first on this one? Um, what, what were your thoughts on the appeal to uh, orcs are good or that at least we're not all bad. Aru created us. 
Yeah. Um, well, I think in general, Adar is, well, first of all, a fantastic character. I love how, uh, is it Jason Maul? I can't remember. Or Joseph Maul. I love the the way he's playing mm. this character. He's probably one of my favorites in the series. But he is really strange because now we do have that confirmation that he was one of the first twisted uh, elves into Uruks. But he still seems to have um like an attachment to his old habits of of the elves in like planting the seeds before battle the that scene where it shows him just basking in the sunlight it just seems quite elven to me and the fact as well throughout all of his scenes he manages to sneak in a little bit of quenya he he's constantly speaking quenya and talking about his time in beleriand as well he he still seems to have held on to uh so to speak, his his soul, I suppose, his elven soul. And this is kind of confusing for me because that whole thing, do orcs have souls or not? And he seems to be immortal because he is heavily suggesting that he is one of the first. Um, mm-hmm. So that's my, that's my kind of confused image of him. But the way he actually speaks about the orcs as his children and how he sees himself like we did hear him in his first episode refer to himself as a potential god i think it was in episode four and then he has this thought of the orcs being made by the one i really believe that he's met sauron already and sauron is basically whispering lies into his ear telling him uh that you know you can be a god and he's giving him these false promises and he's manipulating him to carry out his master plan by you know building the trenches gathering forces of orcs and um yeah uh i don't know i just think he's a very 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 interesting character and i do have some theories where he could actually be sauron himself so i don't know we might get into that a bit later but at the moment <laughs> yeah, next week. <laughs> yeah no, no no my brain is like split i'm like he's definitely someone who's met sauron already he's been lied and manipulated and that person could be halbrand and maybe that whole thing of do you do, do you know who i am no or do you recognize me and, and adar says no like that could that seemed to be a whole sauron conversation there but yeah uh i've like three different theories for adar <laughs> adar so um i've given you one and uh come back to me for the next two <laughs> well, I, I I will come back to you straight away. Well, why do you think yeah. Adar could be Sauron? What what? How do you think that might work? Because they clearly set him up as being here's the mysterious baddie that we can see. There's not been a big baddie in other places, so this is the first time we had somebody who looked evil. But do you? Yeah, I I think just within that conversation he had with Galadriel, um, he talked about killing sauron and i just thought for this whole time i thought i thought that he was one of sauron's lieutenants and you know he massively respected him and we obviously did see that scene where he was almost offended to be called sauron but i kind of thought Mm. maybe he just felt because he wasn't worthy or you know something i didn't look too much into it but the fact that he said i actually killed sauron i stabbed him and split him in two or he says something along those lines Mm. I suggested in our own episode last week that maybe this is kind of kind of similar to how Darth Vader says I killed Anakin Skywalker and basically he's he's talking about he killed his old past of this evil Sauron master manipulator planner to like take over the world and this form of Adar that he's currently in is him in his repentance and he he's now loving the orcs and i think in that conversation he said something like sauron didn't treat the orcs well and um he he did that he abused them or he tortured them manipulated them but he's like these are my children so this is kind of my theory is like this is he he killed the old version of himself and now he's like i'm just happy to chill out with the orcs but he's still quite evil um uh, and uh <laughs> soon he's going to turn the table again and be back to like <laughs> Yeah, and be back to like full Sauron mode of pure evil and not really caring about the orcs. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. But but my bra- as you can see, my brain is so confused because <laughs> I, at one minute I say this and then I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't really make sense because he also does this. And yeah, Well, so I mean, if I can do the... I'll, I'll come to you in a moment, Johnny, but if I can do the... What I play with consider the sort of the, the Occam's razor, razor version of this, which is Adar thinks 
I am the father of all of these. If he is the first or one of the first orcs, if they're going with this idea that the first orcs were these corrupted elves, and then after that they were sort of bred from them, so he retains the immortality, but then the 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 next few generations of orcs do not, and so he is their father, their progenitor in, in some way. Mm. Um, but this is now hundreds of years, millennia later, and he is he is a mythical figure to them. And if he is then creating for them a homeland, and that does actually, in a sort of way, make him their god. That's the sort of the, the way that I could imagine a brain could go to say, okay, I'm not just here being the, the, the father of you all, but also here I am creating for you uh, a homeland for yeah. you to live in. That that's certainly the, as I say, it's the Occam's razor one. It doesn't mean it's the right answer, but it's the simplest answer. That is um, that he just thinks that this is what his role is, and then that is how they will view him. This person who gave us a homeland. We we no longer have to be hiding underground. We can actually come out and be free. Um, but Johnny, I said I'll come to you. What's what's your take on Adar? Um, no, well, first of all, I like uh, I like the idea of maybe Adar possibly ending up being Sauron because I think we all just kind of wrote that off immediately from the start. Mm. Being is thinking it's way too obvious. Even in the first the first time we actually hear a mention of him in episode three, uh, the elves, uh, the friends of Arondir are talking amongst themselves and they say like, oh. Um, Sauron goes by other names and so they kind of speculate that he is Sauron and immediately we, we as fans all go that's too obvious definitely not so we I, we just took that option off the table well I did anyway I think it might be interesting if it, if it actually turned out that he was Sauron because that would definitely be a like uh, a kind of a Triple Princess, Bri Princess Bride <laughs> type of uh, buff yes. like as in did you put it in front of me or did I put it in? yeah well then you yeah. know that I know kind of thing so that would be kind of cool but um I have to say that I, I I never really considered that until just when you said that now, Dave. So I didn't really, I don't think he is. Inconceivable. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Adar, um, yeah, I think I, I agree with you. I think that for me, I've always had the idea that, um, well, first of all, I think um, kudos to the screenwriters to actually try and bring this topic up because I think Tolkien himself spent a lot of his life just kind of avoiding this question almost. And I know he kind of, maybe thought about it a lot. Well, he, he definitely thought about it a lot. But, it, you know, it, it wasn't one that he was going to publish different different answers to. We get to publish one in with Christopher in Silmarillion. We do get a point in The Lord of the Rings when Frodo says that, Frodo tells Sam that basically um, that Morgoth or whoever it was originally, I can't remember the exact quote, but he says that the evil couldn't create new life. So these guys, they came from something else before. So, um that does appear in the Lord of the Rings. And um, I believe that Adar, if he is the father, he's definitely not the father. He's probably the great, 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 great grandfather or something, you know, as you said, maybe millennia before. And I think that if he started out as this twisted Uruk and then he had uh, offspring and then just they had children, they had children. Eventually, the orcs that we see now are the result of uh, this breeding process and this twisting process over so yeah. many years. And yeah, I know. Kind of I don't want to think about but, um, that's why nobody really wants to think about these types of things. But <laughs> Tolkien uh, had to do it, though. Yeah, but basically, I think that the qu the question of ultimately who has souls. I think that for me, in my head canon, I believe that Adar does have his Fea or his soul, and I think that mm. he could end up, you know, going to. I then if if the halls of Mandos is basically like the purgatory kind of area if he's going to go there and kind of get judged or something, I'm not sure what would happen there, but I, I think it's got to the level now where the orcs that are currently alive, they've, it's been so many layers that now that whatever, whatever hope of them having souls, I think for me, that's gone and they don't have a soul anymore. And also they, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, they also, I think over the years they would have lost their, their, um, their long life. They would have lost their immortality. And I, I, again, just being a twisted race, I think that's just bred out of them and they will just now naturally die off almost at, I'm not sure, I would imagine the, the length of the life of men. But that's always kind of been my, my, my the, the thing that I had in the back of my mind. But as I said, I think it's interesting and maybe kind of brave of these screenwriters to just tackle that question. And 
now just one one other point as well is that when I first saw this, I I saw Adar bringing up this point to Galadriel and saying, "This is they are my children. They have a heart. They deserve a place." And I was like, "Well, this is very interesting that it seemed like the show was saying this is the fact." But then Galadriel immediately said quite the opposite and how they are like um, a parasite and they need to just be wiped wiped off the earth and you know that she's not going to wait like uh, she's not going to rest until they're all eliminated so immediately we realized okay so what Adar just said that was his perspective that's his point of view but other perspectives the complete opposite also exists in this world so we have there's just a difference of opinion and who can we really trust in this situation um, well, for me, neither of them at the moment. I don't think Galadriel <laughs> really has her head on straight. And Who's the Adder evil? Certainly, yeah. Which I think, one? Uh, I just think uh, Galadriel's a bit, a little bit lost in this moment. But um, yeah, and, and they they set this up quite early on in the uh, the series with the you know to to reach the light, you have to touch the darkness, and that clearly is where they're wanting to mm. go with Galadriel's arc. Is that she has to go to a dark place in order to be able to then emerge into this uh, wonderful beatific beatific um, uh, ca- uh, character that we know later on uh certainly in the third age but hopefully to, more towards the end of you know, the end of this show yeah um you know I've that, got a, that, oh, sorry. Go well, do you know that um scene of galadriel and halbrand having their little chat sitting on the log mm. i saw a picture after watching the series just it was like a beautiful it almost looks like a painting and i screenshot it and saved it on my phone i was going to tweet it later but i really think it's interesting in that shot that you can see the light coming through the, the, the trees, similarly to that shot of Adar when he's basking in the sunlight. But it, it looks, it's so beautiful. And it's only a few steps away, but Galadriel chooses to sit in the darkness and chat to Halbrand. I don't know, is there anything uh, hmm. metaphorical going on there? But it's it's just that fact that she is so close to the light, but she decides to sit there in the darkness. So, um, yeah, kudos to the showrunners are if if that is what they intended to do because I think well be- yeah absolutely and uh so the way i see it that what they're trying to do is have hellbrand and galadriel they're coming from different directions and reaching the same point and then heading back out again so that is yeah. where we're we're at here mm-hmm. is that we have galadriel who starts out as being this wonderful um sort of character but she has to be touching the darkness so she has to go into this dark place uh Halbrand is actually going to starting to doubt himself. He is starting to be um, uh, maybe I could just not be an evil overlord. Um, (laughs) So gets to that point, but then he pulls back. And so it's they're they're deliberately trying to show a symmetry between them. The the way that they say they both sort of seem to agree. When we were charging there on those horses, I could just feel something. Same here and. They both get the chance to to kill Adar, and the other one calls them back. Um, so the, we're we're trying to be, we're, they're trying to show us a symmetry between these two characters, um, which did has you feel to lead that, up. Did yeah. did you feel that that was a romantic moment, or did you feel mm-hmm. like it was a? Because for me personally, I felt it was almost like a brothers in arms kind of moment, and I think if it if they had dragged it out a bit more, it could have got to the like, you know, kind of longing looks at each other. But I think. I was glad to see it get cut off when it did, but for me, I didn't. I, I didn't really get worried about a possible relationship um, here between Galadriel and Halbrand. But no, a lot of people did. I, I would agree. Yeah. So it's uh, the concern about this has come from there was one of the many, many, many teaser trailers they did was one where they were clearly playing up the mm. um, the, the idea of there potentially being a romantic relationship between them. I think if we went back and looked at that again now, we would probably see almost all of those images that were in that were taken out of context. There yeah. was like the, there was certainly when they were there in Numenor and they were mm. sort of before Farazon and people and he's sort of like uh, giving her a cheeky smile and then, and then you get that moment on the uh, the raft and, and this moment and none of them have been actually romantic um sure. i think there's a kinship that's that's there i think mm. that they they there's a lot in there that they understand the other person to at a quite deep level um yeah. but let's let's talk a little bit about halbrand we sort of 
Um, we've been talking about Adar, so let's move across and we will get onto Halron in just one moment. Uh, because Jacob Wells says, G'day, Robert, g'day. Uh, did Halbrand's interaction with Adar strengthen your Salbrand theory? I prefer Halron, but I can go with Salbrand. Or has your position changed? So, my, uh, I am of the opinion that Halbrand is Sauron. And I think that episode six strengthened that, if anything. So what happened? First of all, he picks up the spear, which is the weapon that we saw him in that flashback in episode one. That's where you know, evil overlord Sauron has a spear. So there's a symmetry going on there. Mm. Then when he does get Adar, the first thing he asks him is, do you know who I am? Mm. Um, which it would be a really weird thing for him to be asking just randomly um do you remember me it's like okay is that the most important thing here right now um probably not unless there is something that happened between them at some point and if it was something that happened between them at some point why doesn't he say it if it's just the yeah you killed my wife and kids or something he mm. could say that. Obviously, Hellbrand never answers any questions. That's just one of his most annoying character traits. It has to be said. <laughs> Someone asks him a question, he just sort of says something enigmatic um, or just walks away, as he did here. But the identity of Hellbrand was also something which was clearly being set up as, as a mystery. When Ad asks, asks, as Hellbrand's walking out, who are you? That's meant for us to be thinking, well, who is he? He's not who he appears to be which is what we've been told right from the very beginning so um the that certainly strengthened not i mean this isn't game-changing stuff i don't think there's anything that i now say i'm 100 there but i still think it looks the most likely thing um and also i have to keep on sort of repeating this because i think it's really important sauron does two things at this point in history Yes, we've got the Celebrimbor thing and the Forging the Rings of Power, but also he becomes King of Mordor. Now, that's what happened to Hellbrand in this episode. <laughs> if there's somebody else who's Sauron, they have only got a very short amount of time now to kick Hellbrand out and become King of Mordor themselves because they have to introduce this new character and there's no one else there who looks like they're about to do that. So... And unless something big happens, he has to remain the prime candidate. But um, I don't know who wants to start on this. John, do you want to start on this? What's your take? You've said you're a, um, a fan of the theory. How likely do you think it is? I can't see any other options at the moment, really. Um, for me, I'm team... Uh, I was going to say... Hal Ron, but uh, I like Sal Brand. I like that as well. I think that's, <laughs> okay. that's kind of a cool. Um, Sounds a bit like sour bread to me, but <laughs> sour bread. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, it's on brand for Sal Brand. Um, so I like that. Uh, but no, I definitely think that he's um, candidate number one for sure. Um, I spoke earlier on in this episode about the possibility of a time difference between the different stories, and maybe you guys have told me that that's not a possibility because we've seen. And I think you're probably right. The reason I kind of had that in my mind was there. I seem like it seems like there has to be someone who is an Anatar or a Sauron figure whispering in the ear of Celebrimbor. And I don't see how that can happen if unless Sauron is someone that's just there um, in a region and we haven't seen him at all, which I think would be a bit weird. I think we, we must have been introduced to the character of Sauron um, by this stage. So. That's why I was kind of thinking maybe it's a possibility that there would be a time jump where we realize, OK, now after this, what we're watching here of this whole development of, of uh, Mordor, maybe he goes and then he spends a long time in the region uh, befriending Celebrimbor. But I don't, as we said, we, that's probably not going to happen now. So what's really strange is the fact that Celebrimbor is so sure of what's going on with the, this Mithril thing <clears throat> without it being Halbrand whispering in his ear. So I don't really know how they're going to answer that question. Um but uh, yeah, in terms of Halbrand being Sauron, I think I agree. I I, I like your. I think you said it um, at least a couple of weeks ago that you thought that whoever, when they mentioned you're going to be the king of the Southlands, and just like, well, the Southlands is just Mordor, so AKA mm. the king of Mordor, and that's going to be uh, Halbrand. So 
if he if he's not Sauron, he better watch his back because he's now just been <laughs> named the king the king of Mordor, and uh, Sauron is certainly not going to be happy with that if if it's not uh, him. It's definitely so, Waldrick. Waldrick, yeah, <laughs> he just stabbed him in the back. He's playing his game like, uh, are you not Sauron? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite lines from the whole TV series. You are Sauron, are you not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's just how I'll serve you, whoever you are. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah. whoever you are, I'll serve you. That was great. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't even remember the original question. Uh, just general just thoughts the, on the whole Sauron about that. Yeah. 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 I'm, I mean, I for me, there wasn't anything in this most recent episode that really pushed me even further either way. I feel like I'm. I feel like maybe there were a couple of scenes where like his conversation with Galadriel, he seemed really honest and he seemed uh, yeah. like er- earnest in that scene where he was trying to say like, you know, I want to try and bind that to my spirit and kind of, and so for like, I could think maybe he is in his moment of, as you said, thinking maybe I'm not going to be this overlord and I could actually find a different path. So maybe he's having this internal conflict at the moment. And by the end of season one, we're going to see the thing that pushes him over the edge to be, okay, now there's only one path for me. I'm going to go down this path and become Sauron. And I mean, I'd be interested to see that as well. But for me, um, yeah, number one candidate, and I don't really even have a number two. So, <laughs> Well, uh, well, I would just, uh, but before going over to, to Dave on this one, I think the language there was really interesting. Bec- and they've put a lot of thought into things like this, I know that I bind that to my soul, my spirit, mm. that's that's a Sauron thing. That's what he does with the One Ring. He, exactly. that, he's literally mm, binding to things to, to, yeah. to his spirit. So um, the idea that he's thinking that and he's he's sort of saying that's a thing I would like to do, I again, it's none of these are uh, sort of foolproof none of them are saying this is definitely the case but the it all just adds up one thing another thing another thing he was a uh, clearly a good smith he's clearly a master manipulator he's clearly mm. got a bit of an evil side to him leaving people to die I mean, all of these things you can add them up one after another and it's just the sheer weight of it and if he's not my take on this is if he is not sauron then they have put a huge amount of work into making us I'm going to say making us, making people who are book nerds think that he might be. Um, sure. Because I think the most casual viewers won't have picked up on the vast majority of those kind of clues. Um, but I think probably the biggest hint of all was when he was in the jail cell and he told Galadriel his master plan, basically, where he said, yeah. you know, um, what do you do in this kind of a context where you want to... Um, finds the, the 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 fear or the weakness of your enemy, and then Galadriel says, "Oh, and exploit it." And he says, "No, give them a way to master it, and then that way you can master them." So in this case, we could just say, "Okay, well, exactly what what is happening here? Some rumor has caused the elves to have this great fear, and he is going to provide the way to master their fear to to find an ex- an escape from that with these rings of power, and then with those rings, he's going to dominate them." So it's like that was just. He's like, here's my four-step plan, and uh, this is exactly what I'm going to do later on. So, for me, uh, uh, since that, I was like, There's, uh, that's just way too much of a uh, of a giveaway. It, it yeah, absolutely, yeah. and that that ties in with what I think at the risk of sort of heading down to the dwarves and elves thing. Yes, this is exactly as you say, exactly what you would expect Anatar to be saying to the elves. What are they most scared of? The fading thing. Mm. Let's give them a way out of that. Oh, there's this Mithril. Why might he want Mithril? Because he wants to be forging stuff with it. So that all kind of uh, works for me as well. But Dave, what's your what's your take on all of this? Uh, Sour brand Halron, yeah, well, well, I think it's true. <laughs> I've already mentioned how I have a an a- add-on, Adron theory <laughs> of, but like, yeah, the whole Saldar. Brand. <laughs> so Johnny, you were mentioning how like there kind of needs to be some sort of Witcher or Westworld kind of time difference between both storylines because why is Celebrimbor? preparing this forge before spring why why is this rumor of the what is it the song of the roots of the hithyglir because hopefully that's a lie by sauron I'm, I'm banking on that like why is that a thing why why is the the tree dying i think that if halbrand is sauron all this happened 
we've Sauron has already been in Eregion, has already been in Linden or wherever, and he's already been spreading his lies. And whatever he did, we might get to see a flashback in the next episode or, or the, the last episode. He got himself into that shipwreck and for whatever reason, he was trying to meet with Galadriel and get to Numenor. Now, I don't know why he would want to get to Numenor and not want to stay there because you would think he would want to be you know whispering in the ears of whoever but maybe it was maybe it's just a means to get around he he didn't he didn't Sorry, have were you were you saying that maybe he was in a region before he ended up on that raft yeah is that what you're saying okay sorry I just yeah, yeah, yeah yeah quite catch that that that's what i mean i because because he has to he has to be there he has to be unless at night time he's just turning into a bat and he's flying yeah over there. <laughs> he's just, that's true. i was thinking still like, a very long way away yeah. I mean, I I think where they split him in two and he's just like in two places at once but no um i think he's got to have all that done earlier and maybe, maybe when we get the reveal of halbrand or sauron we'll get like flashbacks of like keller brimbor and halbrand being like how do you do or maybe it's not mm. halbrand maybe it's Anatar, or I don't know if they can say the, the name Anatar, but yeah, but um, I still kind of hope that it's not Halbrand and this is all a big misdirect. It's impossible to know because this is season one of a TV show. We don't know how they treat their viewers. Do they do they like to have twists and turns or do they like to completely throw them off the scent? Uh, it's just hard to know. But yeah, there, there are lots of things that don't seem right, like that confession scene to Galadriel in the workshop where he seems genuine. And it's not like, yeah, he's just manipulating her. He seems genuine to the audience. We're supposed to, like, he's not supposed to be manipulating us. Like, we're, we're just watching this from, uh, <laughs> the mass from outside the box. And <laughs> he seems very genuine in his decision. And the whole thing of him dropping his sigil pouch purse thing, um, like you said, Johnny, before, that wasn't in front of anyone. He wasn't manipulating anyone. That was mm. just for the audience to see. So if that is the case, and if he is Sauron, I don't want him to have these doubts. And I, I just want him to be fully evil at this time. But the problem is, is he just doesn't seem to be this master manipulator with a huge plan. He's kind of just bumbling from from one thing to the other and he's like oh do i want to be the king of the southlands sure. no not really i'm just running away i'm going with the flow i'm running from my past like, it, like it, there's no doubt that there is a big secret attached to halbrand i just hope that that secret isn't surprise mm. i'm sauron um <laughs> well, i do hope I mean, they I have think... another trick up their sleeve but yeah i mean i think that, that you've you put your finger on something i've been sort of mulling over for a while is that the it doesn't quite add up is that if, and, and when I did my Sauron's master plan video a, a while ago, setting out my thought, this is Hal Brand, that I, I said, I definitely thought that he'd started off in Eregion. He put the idea there in Celebrimbor's mind. He should build a massive forge. He put the idea there with the elves that they're going to fade. And then he sort of said, right, I'll be back in three months. And, and then sort mm. of headed off. Um, now I need to go off and become King of Mordor. That was what my... My thing did he what? poison the tree in Linden as well? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, the 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 elf just as a random thing, the elf fading thing, is that it n none of them realise this that that doesn't add up at all. Is that Gilgalad it seems to be the only person who who knows that this is happening? But surely, if the elves were going to fade in three months, then they would start to feel something a little bit, yeah. you know, getting some tingly feelings or something. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what it feels like to be about to fade, but, but we haven't had any hint of that from Galadriel or Elrond. So, yeah, I think that that was um, uh, Sauron uh, Anatar on his way through, just corrupting that one mm -hmm. tree. Uh, which is very much like an um, echo of uh, Morgoth with the sure. uh, the two trees of Valinor to start mm -hmm. with. Um, so that seemed to work for me, this idea that we have this master manipulator pulling all the strings behind the scenes. But then he does seem to be having this kind of like crisis of confidence. So mm -hmm. how do they add up? When did he get this crisis of confidence? Presumably after what happened with adar and the uh the killing him thing which yeah go, um, go I was, on I, I was just going to quickly say that i think um if we were to get to see a story about sauron having moments of doubt and then having something 
push him over the edge to finally make the decision that this is the path I'm going to go down. I think that's a really cool idea and that would be a cool story. But I don't think that's the same story as the one that we're supposed to be seeing of him creating the rings of power. Because I believe at that moment, he's he's full in on his plan yeah. of what he's going to do. It's not like, okay, fine, I'm going to go ahead with this plan. I'm going to start tomorrow. Uh, it seems like that's a plan that you know is in the works for a long, long time before he actually goes through with it. So I don't think that this could possibly be his moment of doubt or genuine repentance. So it just seems a little bit strange. It just doesn't really add up. Yeah, absolutely. Let's um, let's talk about that sort of uh, the the Adar Sauron thing. Um, Daiwa is saying, hi, Robert. I uh, hope you're well. I am. Thank you. Um, always thought it was interesting how Maya are described to change forms in the books. Adar says he killed Sauron. I agree that I doubt he actually uh, did kill Sauron, likely shapeshifting. But if he did, then would that mean Sauron would be a spirit again? How does the spirit to body thing work for Sauron? From my reading, I thought the Valar were the ones to reinstate Maiar back into their bodies. Does Sauron not need this? Um, well, just in terms of sort of Tolkien's legendarium, um, the the Maiar, which is this class of spiritual beings, which includes Sauron as well as people like Gandalf, Saruman as well, uh, Balrogs, certainly in le Tolkien's later conception of them, are also Maiar. They are spiritual beings who inhabit physical bodies or can inhabit physical bodies some seem to stick to that one body for a very long time others seem to shape shift quite a bit but they are essentially a spiritual being so when you see things like at the very end uh, saruman's story then he gets killed and then a kind of a spirit a cloud sort of emerges up and that's his spirit emerging um the idea being that that could then become another body sauron we're told is very good at shape-shifting if you go back and read the silmarillion you'll find he shifts i mean very within the space of minutes from a werewolf to a to a vampire to other things or and it's just like he he changes his body so the killing from the perspective of someone like adar killing sauron he might cut his body down and destroy the body but the spirit is still there and it could just take on a new physical form i think the confusion sometimes comes with gandalf who when gandalf died his spirit did it made its way or he sort of wandered around uh, sort of different sort of spiritual realms and got sent back by uh Uru Iluvatar himself that i think was just gandalf's spirit just heading to a good place because that's naturally where he wanted to go whereas Sauron would not want to do that he would want to inhabit another body so the feeling here for me at least is that what if Sauron got killed his body got killed he would then take on Halbrand's body and then head off around the world with that and it it will look to everybody around him as if he had been killed, but he actually wasn't dead. How does that fit with uh, with what you guys think? Do you think do you think Adar was lying about killing uh, Sauron, or do you think, as per what I've just said, he thought he did? It's just that Sauron then took on a new body. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I guess isn't the first time that Sauron's corporal form is destroyed? Isn't that supposed to be the downfall of Numenor? Uh, yes, yeah, so the body, what happened there? So the downfall of Numenor, which is towards the end of the Second Age, this is a god event, and mm. it is so powerful. Literally god intervening in the world to completely drown um, the island of, of Numenor. And it's so powerful that Sauron, although his spirit survived, his body is destroyed completely, and he loses the ability to to choose what form he could yeah, to take on uh, a fair form. take on and he just has to be the sort of the physical representation of who he is which is where he becomes this sort of dark lord figure so yeah that's that's when his his body is physically killed but it's not just it's not because that was the first time that that happened okay it may, have been, yeah. it may not have been it was just that because this was literally god himself doing something it was so immense and that's what mm. 
changed his abilities or prevented him from using those abilities. Yeah, well, it, that's totally fine then if the show wants to do this thing of Adar being the one to kill Sauron uh, or in his mind thinking he's killing Sauron but he's actually just killing a form of Sauron and then Sauron's Fea leaves the body and goes somewhere else. Um, yeah, that's that's totally cool. I'd be up for seeing that. Uh, like, I did think at the time that it was metaphorical when Adar said that I split him in two and I I killed Sauron. And I mentioned earlier how I kind of felt like it was almost like Darth Vader saying I killed Anakin or mm. Anakin Skywalker is dead now. Um, that could be a thing where Adar is himself <laughs> Sauron, but I'm, I'm not going to keep uh, blowing that. He blowing killed that him with a lightsaber. Anymore, but... Um, yeah, I I think it I think it could be a metaphorical one, but Robert, if you believe that this is going to be his actual body dying and him taking on Halbrand's form, I'm totally cool yeah. with that as well. I mean, do, do you do you think there's a chance? Maybe Johnny, you pick up on this one. There are lots of thoughts flying around the nerdy parts of the internet that this is when he talks about splitting him. He's literally like splitting mm. him like a Horcrux, which is a sort of thing that Sauron obviously does. He pours a lot of himself into the One Ring, so it's not a it's not a mm. non Tolkien idea. But do you think there is this chance? This is how some people have got around this idea. That Sauron could be Hellbrand, but at the same time is is hiding in a region, uh, whispering sweet nothings into Celebrimbor's ear. Do you think, Johnny, we could be seeing two Saurons in this show? I don't. I don't uh, really buy into that. Um, I mean, they could go that way for sure, but I think um, for me, no. I, I I don't think we we could have an omnipresent Sauron. I know that he pours his spirit and his strength and his malice and all of that into certain, uh, he can pour it into the one ring, for example, but I don't think he can pour his consciousness into another being at the same time. Again, I, I don't know if there's anything in the lore to say that that was not possible, but I don't think that that is the case. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, I, I think that seems a bit strange. Uh, a so, yeah, I mean, I think I'm with you on that one. I, I don't. Mm. I mean, I don't like this idea. It's not a not a thing that Tolkien ever mm. did. You know, there are two versions of a person walking around. That's not sure. really what we're yeah. looking at. It, it works for me that he was in Region, mm. then he left, and then he's going to go back again afterwards. Um, and it's worth, of course, noting that at the moment, the people in Region have no idea who Hellbrand is or what he looks like. So. Yeah. He could turn up and they could not know that this is the, the King of Mordor arriving. They, they just think it's somebody completely different. Um, Galadriel may well turn up, obviously, as well. But at the moment, these are completely different uh, people who have met Halbrand and not met Halbrand. Do you think when he do you think if we actually eventually see a flashback, for example, of him having conversations with Keller Brimbor, it'll be the same? Is it Charlie Vickers? Is that the name of the actor? It'll mm -hmm. be the same actor but just with like the elf ears or something <laughs> and, and wearing like elven clothes. That'd be kind of funny. Or maybe it's going to be, he is I quite fair to be, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he is of a fair hue. I don't think that, I don't think there's many people who would doubt that he would fit that part of the description, mm. but I think, I think you this will be, be the last. Well. Yeah. I think that the, he, this will be the last shot scene of the season. I think the, revelation of Sauron is going to be where they leave it. And and if this mm. is Hellbrand, then it, they could do this in a number of different ways. If if Hellbrand has gone missing, which from the promo stuff we've seen for the next episode, I, I certainly haven't seen Hellbrand in the, the teaser trade or anything like that. If they could have it as something as simple as uh, Keller Brimbor just in the last scene going, ah, you have returned, my friend. The forge is now ready for you. And then oh. in walks Hellbrand. And it's like, oh, yeah. hang on a moment. Um, yeah. That's what's been going on. So the, I, I think that they will want to leave us on a revelation of, of Sauron. I mean, yeah, I definitely. don't think they're going to have him like putting the helmet on or something like that. No, but it's, no, no. it's going to be very clear who this mm. is. Now, if he turns out not to be Sauron, I'm not sure if either of you have seen the, the images online as well on Twitter of the... Um, like the the arm brace or the 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 oh, covering the for thing. with the rings that is yeah, it looks yeah. like it's the same as the the king of the dead. Uh, oh, 
okay. did you see that there's someone shared image and again i i didn't go back and watch that scene from the return of the king but um there was definitely someone had taken this a, a freeze frame from a, one of the images of the king of the dead and he had sort of a similar um armor on his on his sleeve that halbran seems to wear so i mean that would be interesting <laughs> as well again when, but, whenever i see but, those comparisons of even when the first promotional images came out and it showed Adar's hand and people were like, oh my God, this really looks like it could be the Witch King, you know, Witch King from Peter Jackson's trilogy. But mm. like, they, I, I know now Narsil sure. is pretty much the same. Uh, it looks the exact same as Peter Jackson's trilogy, but that's a very specific and special item. Uh, I don't think that they're going to have, you know, him wearing the rings and then wearing the same gauntlets and gear as whatever the gauntlets, king of the dead that's what I'm trying to, yeah yeah, yeah um, i wouldn't take that as a as a big clue myself uh, because they they are all contractually not allowed to be um imitating what was in the peter jackson films mm-hmm. so they can't i think they wouldn't be allowed to do it as a plot point obviously there has to be a degree of fuzzy continuation sure. between them but i think if they were to make it as a he's going to wear this armor which is a bit like that character in the film's war i mean i i took it and looked at it and go oh rings uh so that was the that's <laughs> yeah, that yeah. maybe i'm, yeah, I'm trying too. to look at everything with 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 hellbrand and trying to work what symbolism are they doing here how does this make him fit in with um uh with sauron but no i mean i i, I don't hate this idea that he's the the, the the king of the dead um but it's a bit I early for that, that isn't it? yeah that doesn't he won't really need to be appearing until season four or something like that so uh, i think what you no. said earlier on i think what you said earlier on robert is important that the amount of work that they've put into this character to kind of make us feel like he is sauron would be very strange if that was all just swept under the mat and in the end it was just revealed like oh he's not even that big well i mean maybe he could be another big well he has some character. secret definitely well, he yeah, does have like, a big secret but i mean if it doesn't turns out if he turns out not to be Zaron, i'll just feel like very strange the amount of work yeah. that they put into it i mean if, if he's not Sauron, then they've created a smith master manipulator king of mordor <laughs> who who they then have to have someone else come in being the exact same person so I don't know. It's it. It has to. Surely it has to be. Um, yeah. I can't. I, well, maybe he's I mean, just they, doing they his do master's it. bidding. Maybe he's like the the Shaw to Mourinho, uh, the Luke Shaw to Mourinho, where he's not really Mourinho's <laughs> the actual brain and pulling the strings and Halbert's I mean, just I mean, doing I, the whatever only, he does. The only bit of that analogy, and, and for uh, <laughs> apologies for people who are not fans of uh, football in Manchester United, the only bit of that analogy I like <laughs> is the idea that this makes Jose Mourinho <laughs> Sauron. Um, so uh, the let's let's take a question from uh, Kelly Summers, saying a uh, sort of revisiting this from last week. Do you think there is mm-hmm. any more support for the idea that Sauron hasn't taken Hellbrand's form yet? I can't understand why Sauron wouldn't want to let Galadriel kill Adar and fall down a dark path herself. He would feel like a, well, it would feel like a good scene to have Sauron confront and try and sway Halbrand and have Halbrand resist only for Hel- Sauron to kill him and to take his form. All the foreshadowing still holds, but with a meta twist because Sauron would be mocking the original Halbrand that Galadriel knew. So, um, I mean, my take, I'll come to you, on this one in a moment guys but i mean my my take is that i think halbrand probably was a real person and i think halbrand uh, sauron did kill him and he said you know i took this from a dead man i think that is just mm. him being honest that he killed someone and took his took mm. his stuff from him um i think halbrand probably is the rightful um king of the the southlands but sauron's just taken on his form so i think that's happened in the past um but what's your what's your take on this um uh dave let's go to you first on this one do you think it's possible i uh, i'll sort of expand it out either that he's not yet hellbound and will be at some point or the other thing that we've been some people have speculated is we've not seen he him at all uh, sauron just has not appeared at all in, in this show um, yeah, I never actually considered that before. This whole thing of Halbrand was a, an actual real person before in the past, and and now that you've 
brought it up. I'm trying to think, is there a point in the show that we've seen so far where we still have seen Halbrand, like the real Halbrand, and maybe the last two episodes he was actually killed and Sauron has taken his form now. And mm. I'm just trying to see, is there an actual gap in the timeline there where that could have taken place? I don't know. Uh, I'd never really thought about Sauron taking on a form and that form had already been of someone else. Like mm. Anatar. Was Anatar a real elf? Um, who knows? Or did like, you know, did that this did he rob the skin of someone? <laughs> um yeah, uh interesting. I, like if it if it is going to be Halbrand, that is Sauron. I think with all the clues that they've laid out before, he 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 has been Sauron has been Halbrand the entire time since before the show took place. Um yeah, that would be it's too confusing to think of any other way, so I'm just not going to do that. Uh, or else I'm not going to do that live on air right now. I'm going to sit down, have a nice <laughs> cup of tea, I'm going to get my notebook out, and I'm going to write down all the pros and cons for why Halbrand is or isn't Sauron. Sounds like a good idea. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, kind of surprised at the idea of... Uh, I, I mean, if, if it is this way, then I'm happy to accept it, but I never really thought that Sauron would have needed... A corporal form to inhabit that already existed i thought that he would have been able to kind of create his own corporal form but maybe maybe i'm wrong and that mm, i yeah. i always thought that anatar for example was just he just took on the form because as a shapeshifter he doesn't need to kind of go okay i want to be a bat i'm going to kill a bat over there and then i'm going to become that bat. i thought he just turns his body into that bat yeah. and he turns into a snake he turns into a a, a werewolf so I just imagine that maybe and but look, when you said there that uh, he said that he took he stole the thing the 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 sigil from mm-hmm. a dead man that's kind of a cool thing that he did kill Halbrand who was the original um king of Mordor. potential king king of mm. the southlands and then he yeah. took on his body then but for me just from the past I've always just imagined that he could just uh, create the body without um from nothing basically so he could be like Mystique from X Men, where he actually has the power to just like look at someone and then change into that form exactly, and then it's up to him if he wants to go and kill that person or not. So there could be there could be two Halbrands out there, but yeah, no, he took it off a dead man. That's <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, In- let's uh, let's shift this up to the, the elves and the dwarves. I think we've, we've just talk, talked quite a bit about the uh, Hellbrand. Mm. Um, uh, Philip de Paula in the chat saying the three month deadline for the forge was because of the elves fading and thinking they'd use the forge to make all the mithril gear for the elven population. That's my take anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, certainly a, a good way of sort of linking those two uh, deadlines that we had. Um, but what's your what's your overall take then on what's going on? Uh, up there and perhaps specifically um i don't know johnny whether you want to pick up this, this gilgalad who is um in the books he's this great and wise leader but he seems to be operating i wouldn't say in an odd way but in a different way to the way that we might expect him to he's he thinks that there's all the elves are, are about to to fade because the evil is returning. But he, if evil's returning, why did he recall all of his troops from far off lands? Um, and that he seems to be sending um, uh, Elrond off in order to try and get the mithril, but that he doesn't tell him that he's got to go and get some mithril. That there's there's something going on here with Gilgalad. What's what's your take? Gilgalad is Sauron. That's uh, not true. <laughs> uh, here first. Yeah, I no, I I don't know. I'm I'm very confused with Gilgalad's uh, trajectory of his character at the moment because um, I, I I really liked him in his first introduction in episode two. I I liked how I, I had absolutely nothing against the fact that uh, we saw Elrond writing his speech for him. For example, a lot of people thought this is Gilgalad. He should be able to write his own speech, damn it, and all this. And I thought, no, wh- wh- why wouldn't he have someone to just write his speech for him? I mean, it, it, you know, just I didn't see anything wrong with that. And then later on, the way that he had that conversation with Elrond uh, and he told him that, look, I know what's going on and I know that there is evil out there and I'm purposefully sending Galadriel away to try and uh, like mitigate that. I, I enjoyed that and I thought, okay, I like, what, I like where this is going. But pretty much everything I've seen of Gil-Galad since episode two, 
I've been kind of questioning if that's what I would imagine Gilligala would choose to do, especially just so, uh, well, I mean, we haven't seen anything about his reasoning for believing Celebrimbor, uh, and, well, him and Celebrimbor believing that uh, that there's this fading that's going to happen. And um, also I heard the, the Tolkien professor talking about it, that when they speak about the fading, which we know fading is something that happens in the books, um, what was really important is what the Tolkien professor brought up was that it wasn't just fading of their body, but they actually say the fading of their immortal souls, which is definitely not what Tolkien uh, wrote. And uh, it sounds like that's kind of a just completely crazy notion that just not just their body could fade away, but that their actual, their immortal souls, their fea, could just dwindle into nothing. And especially in this, like, as we said earlier, the space is three months Um as you as you said it, that that sounds like a really difficult and long process for you to go from a completely fully fledged being with a immortal fiery soul and then suddenly to be nothing it doesn't seem like that could just happen overnight so surely at this point they should be starting to feel those effects already and just a one tree that's you know withering um you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket i suppose so he seems very like he's just believing things on a whim and he's just kind of going, oh, you reckon that this is going to happen? Well, I just saw this leaf fall. So yeah, you're probably right. Let's just go and get loads of mithril because again, it's just, it's it's way too um, wishy-washy and I don't I don't believe it for a second and I just can't believe that Gilgala can't see through that as well. So, I mean, if there were other elves out there that did believe it and maybe even they fooled Killer Brimbor, but... I mean, I just wanted Gil Gala to be this overseer of everything and just be way more insightful and maybe more shrewd in his thinking as well. So I, again, we, we, we need to spend more time with the character, but um, yeah. from what I've seen so far, I, I've been left underwhelmed, I would say. Yeah, and just before you jump in, Dave, just uh, I spotted we've just hit 5K, $5,000. Yeah, uh, dollars. Ooh. Thank you so much, everyone. Well this done. is a charity stream. Well done, this is an aid of Alzheimer's care and research. So if you have donated, I, I saw a few uh, very generous donations today. So thank you uh, hugely. They, they go through too quickly for me to be uh, able to shout out everyone. But uh, thank you. Uh, it's hugely appreciated. Let's see whether we can push on a little bit more. Uh, we've got another another few live streams to go before uh, be both shows finish. Uh, so yeah, let's see how much higher we can get. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. But let's go uh, to Dave. What's your what's your take on, on Gilgal? Do you, on Gilgal? I mean, there's something going wrong, isn't there? There's something not adding up. Yeah, well, again, like Johnny said, we we haven't gotten near enough time with him, so we don't really know what's going on in his mind. But I I don't feel like he is overly, I don't know, like just believing the first thing that he hears. I feel like whatever lies he's been told, it's been poisoning his mind for a long time. But he's also not, he he's not like telling everyone about it. Oh oh guys we're all gonna lose our souls in three months he's he's being shrewd with the information that he has he's sending um elrond off on this task and you know he's not showing his his full hand to anyone at the moment he's being a very very cautious king and those are some of the attributes i really like about him where he knows a lot more than he's letting on and he's not telling anyone half of what he knows but yeah, you're you're right. He likes less than like half the... of the people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> While I was speaking, I was like, this reminds yeah. me of something. Is it Lord of the Rings? <laughs> um, yeah, no, but there is definitely, there's there, there's a lot more on the surface on the, in the other stories, like the, the Numenor storyline, the Southland storyline, but it feels like whatever is going on in Linden, Eregion, and Casa Doom, it's just so I don't know what is real, what is a, a lie at this point. I kind of feel like everything is a lie to do with the the song of the roots of the Hithaiglir. Um that, like th that has to be. And the whole poisoning of the tree thing, that must be Sauron as well. But I I still mm. I still hold on to the fact that Gilgalad is just being overly cautious and overly suspectful of everyone and anything like I don't know if he fully believes it himself. He's just he's just playing devil's advocate and to himself. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was another language thing, incidentally, there with um, when Elrond asks Gilgalad, "Who knows?" Uh, and Gilgalad says, "Precious few," 
Now, <laughs> that immediately makes you think of the ring and therefore Sauron. So, I don't know. I I am holding out hope that he ha- he knows at least some of what's going on. Maybe he, he was calling Elrond fit. precious. Maybe it's like precious. Few. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that was it. Maybe this is precious. like... <laughs> Precious, He's like, listen, uh, uh, listen, child. precious. Uh, only yeah. a few people know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, a little pet. Sorry for the interruption. There. No, no, no. That's that's fine. I'm I'm, I'm loving it. But the so I th- I I'm holding out hope that he's got this great master plan that he's he's yeah. trying to um, understand or, or or sort of smoke out what's going on by pretending to go along with it. So that's my hope for him, is that actually he does know that this is just a, a lie, but like he's going it. along with it to try and find out where this lies come from and what's the problem. Fingers crossed. That's what I'm, mm. I'm hoping. The, the issue is that it still doesn't quite work for me um, with him being this great and wise leader because there are things like, you said about the, the sending off Galadriel thing, I didn't like that. Um, yeah. There was a whole big law change thing about uh, being a gatekeeper to Valinor, which I, I didn't mm. like. But but more to the point, it just smelt to me as if he uh, says, oh, we've had this vision that your pursuit of Sauron is going to be fanning the flames of him, his return kind of thing. And so you need to get on a boat and go away. It's just, this is surely, this is the, the basic storytelling trope that his act of doing that puts her in on the path to yeah. uh, inadvertently fanning the flames and getting Sauron back, which would work if Sauron is Halbrand. So he's not quite as wise as he might think he is. So I, I don't know. I'm holding out hope that he's he's got some clever cunning plan going on, but it's like that always reminds me of the the oracle from the matrix where she's talking to to neo and she says and don't worry about the vase and he's like what vase he turns around he knocks it over and he shatters the vase and she says now you're going to be wondering if you would have broken it if i hadn't said anything and it's one of those kind of things Mm. that yeah she knew this was going to happen but if she hadn't said anything maybe i mean just one of those kind of things that as you said it that's probably what set her on the path yeah but yeah. also, just before we move on to anything else, um, I'm not, again, I'm bringing up all these images that I've seen online. I've just been spending way too much time on Twitter reading things. But Tell there was one that. image that showed um, Gil Galad and his gold armor that he wears or his outfit. Uh, he's got this kind of um, oh, image yeah. on his chest that looks like kind of a river or something. It's the exact same shape as what Adar wears on his. So I'm not sure what's going on there. But um, I think that's just uh, th- whatever elven gear that they have uh i've seen that i've seen a few other examples of that where like one evil character has this and a good character one of it's one of them's black and the other one's gold so it's kind of yeah like yeah well their souls or something but it was yeah. kind of like when we first got the trailers and there was one orc that was wearing what looked like an elven helmet mm. and i think i Maybe. think that's what it is like i know gilgal is the high king and he should be wearing like high kingly clothes and not some regular uniform but yeah it is it is cool because they're very similar um, do you guys feel like they should I, be having more wardrobe changes instead of just like Gilgalad wearing uh, the same thing all the time? I, I don't mind. I mean, Keller Brimbor, I want to be. I mean, I want him to Get have more than that. one room in the region, and I want him to have more than one robe there. So, but I, yeah, apart from that, no, I'm not got a problem with that. I have to say, I've never it's, really thought about that too much. Yeah, for example, no, people, okay like, pe- people like people like Brand, I'm like, okay, he's you know he's just arrived off a raft. He doesn't have you know a suitcase with him, so I'm fine with that. But, but he's had more costume changes than Lady Gaga, or well, than anyone else <laughs> in the show. <laughs> Lady Galadri, yeah, Ga- Lady Ga- Galadri. Galadri. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I will move us on now though, because uh, I want to talk about the Harfoots <laughs> and the Stranger. Mara Lee saying, "What do you think will be the role of the Harfoots uh, in the show moving forward? Will they end up in the Shire at the end of it all?" Um, I mean. Personally, I hope they don't end up in the Shire because that shouldn't happen until the Third Age. But what do you think the 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 role um, of them is, Dave? Do you, perhaps you want to go first on this one. We'll talk about the Stranger in a second, but mm-hmm. um, what is they've kept apart from the main storylines, other than with the Stranger. What what do you think their role is beyond this? Yeah, well, first of all, I hope they continue to keep their 
the whole storyline completely separate from everyone else because I don't want them to meet an elf or a man or an orc or any of that. Um, but I think the whole reason that the Harfoots exist in this show is, of course, we need to have hobbits in a Lord of the Rings TV show. And this is the closest thing we can get to getting away with it. But in terms of where their story is actually going, like Nori and her friend, whatever her name is, Poppy, um, I don't think they have much of a story, whatever it is. It's just going to be solely to play out the, the stranger storyline. They, they wanted... They probably wanted a mystery and they also wanted hobbits or harfoots. So they just combined them two together and they're just going to be helping this stranger, hopefully a blue wizard, um, become whoever he is to be. And I just think it's going to be one of those things that we flash to in every couple of episodes to see what they're doing. It kind of reminds me of when we were watching Game of Thrones and we'd flash back and see what Bran is doing. You're like, I don't really care about Bran. (laughs) <laughs> and maybe they'll do the same thing as what they did to Bran. They just cut out the Harfoots for a, a whole season. Um, but yeah, I think it's just solely t- to 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 get the the Stranger storyline in motion. I don't I don't think that they're going to end up in the Shire. Although listening to Bear McCreary on your mm. on your interview the last day, which was really really cool. Um, yes, class. I li- I like the way he talked about maybe if they're you know to finish in the Shire at the very end, and then that would seem right. To have a thematic hobbit, um, you know, doo-doo-doo, doo-doo-doo. Um, yeah, that would have been nice. But I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where they're going to end up. I just think they're, they're, the show will end and they'll still be traveling to a distant land, find, trying to find a place to settle down. But no, not the Shire. Not the Shire for me. I'll just let me pick up on the Ben McCreary. If you've not watched the, the interview I did with him, it was from about a week or so ago. Uh, do I, I mean, I don't normally recommend my own videos but uh <laughs> bear was a really really interesting person to talk oh, to we can recommend and there was it some, for you if you want I, well I I'll, yeah, let's pretend you're you're doing it but i i will give bear the big build up because i think that he uh there, there are a few things in there that i thought were absolutely fascinating that first of all the structure of how he built up the the, the sounds and how much he thought about this um, but that also there was a sort of almost a throwaway line about um, when he first met the showrunners and he was saying, uh, if we only do one thing with this, can this be the rehabilitation of Isildur? And they were like, yes, and I love him for that. I think that's a fantastic idea that he came into this wanting a character who most people only know from that like, opening Isildur moment of that. You know, mm-hmm. I was there when you know the strength of man failed. Let's show him for the hero who he actually is um and also he said and this got a lot of people on on twitter in the comment section going was he said the his new one ring theme oh yeah has appeared in the show already in fact two or three times in episode one alone and so all of these kind of like very musical people have immediately gone out and tried to figure out where this is so if if you and there's more in there as well um uh, so there was a, a lot there so if you're at all interested in that please do go and check out that video but that's a complete digression just because you mentioned it um uh, uh johnny perhaps uh do you want to pick up on do you see a, a role for the half going forward um, I don't know. I'm really surprised at the fact that they're still all together. I really thought that what was going to happen was that we were going to get the sort of Frodo and Sam, Frodo and Sam story where some of the hobbits needed to leave their comfort and go off on this big adventure. And I was pretty sure that when uh, when Nori was like becoming friends with the stranger, something was going to happen. Something was going to separate them from the rest of the clan and they were going to go off and have their own little adventure together. And the fact that that hasn't happened and we're still just there's they're all, everyone's together and now the strangers become part of their kind of little group. Um, it's just it's not been what I was expecting. So I'm a little bit surprised by that. And I don't really when I kind of sit down after the shows, and I think about where things are going and what I'd like to see happening. I'm not really usually thinking about the Harfoots. It's not really the ones, the ones that I'm kind of pondering. I wonder where this is going to go because I, I, I'm not really that interested i kind of enjoy some of the parts I, i'm not going to say i completely completely hate and going to just completely write off the, the harfoots because some of their scenes have been quite endearing i especially liked the the uh, the scene from episode five with the the wandering song uh, mm. that was that was really sweet and 
it was really nice to see that kind of development. Um, and I, I have to say, I had listened to the song a few times before that episode came out. And I was like, OK, it's quite nice. But when I saw it in context with the visuals, I really, um, I don't know, it felt very emotional in that moment as well. And it was really, really quite nice. So I did enjoy that. I'm not going to say I'm completely against the Harfoots. But personally, I don't really have too many theories about where they're going. Um, I agree kind of to, with Dave that they're kind of just being used as a vessel to kind of go through and show us what's happening with the stranger and what's happening with his storyline. So I wouldn't be disappointed if they kind of just disappeared for long periods of time and we kind of checked in with them every now and again and saw what was happening. But um, yeah, they're a nomadic group. They're completely different to the Hobbits. And as uh, Bear was pointing out in, in the in the uh, in your live stream with him, uh, the music that we get with the, the Hobbits and the Shire, it's like it's comfortable music because they feel like they're at home they're not a nomadic tribe anymore they're not travelers they are settled they love the comforts of the comforts of their own home so they're completely different in that respect as well so i mean i don't know if we'll ever i, I don't expect that we'll see them arriving at the shire but uh i don't know there's a long way to go and i think as well we know that the showrunners have a general idea of how they want this show to go uh, they've said that they have the idea for the last shot that they want to do um whether we can believe them or not is a different story, but I think they'll take on board a lot of the ideas and well, maybe the the praise and the criticism from season one, and they'll kind of find their own way to go with that. So that might mean more or less Harfoots coming in in seasons two and three, but um, that remains to be seen. Um, either way, I've I've not got huge feelings about them, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I found them I found them nice and enjoyable, and and I agree. The the, the wandering song was excellent and it looked really nice i love the kind of the indiana jones kind of go on a map which where are they yeah, going class. that that yeah, all worked well yeah. um but they do seem to be a, a meteor man delivery system they're, they're it's like their their role in this season i had thought that they would end up in mordor they may still end up in mordor who knows but mm. i had thought that they were effectively acting to bring him into the southlands plot i thought that that was where they're going um I'm not so sure about that now. It's possible that they could go that way, but who? I, I think this all boils down to who the stranger is, and then that will tell us what role they might have, sort of going forward. Now, I'll, I'll sort of start off by saying I was very much Team Belrog to start with. I'm not so much there now. For a variety of reasons, we could perhaps get into uh, if people are interested. But um, I think Amaya, Amaya is definitely what this looks like um, because this is certainly magical, certainly in uh, in human form, but not human. Uh, there's there are echoes of Gandalf, as people have said. Uh, I mm. don't want it to be Gandalf, but you know the mixing with the the hobbits and the gray um kind of uh, sort of cloth thing that he's wearing that is very gandalfy and there's also the fireflies seem to be a bit like gandalf talking to the moth so there is some imagery going on there the blue wizards we should get a couple of blue wizards in the second age so maybe that but i don't know it's um i'm i'm now in a world of struggling to find something that i i would get excited by the reveal of but if it's kept apart from the rest of the plot but what's your i mean i don't know who wants to start whoever whoever's got an idea on, on who this is a strong idea who is the stranger well i i think both myself and johnny have always hoped from the beginning that it would be one of the blue wizards and for a number of reasons uh, well the main one is that it wouldn't be lore breaking because, you know, there is a part of Tolkien's canon that says that they actually did come to the Middle Earth in the Second Age. So that's one good thing. So that's check. And then the other thing is they're, they're definitely playing with is the stranger a good guy? Is the stranger a bad guy? And again, with Tolkien's canon, that could be either or they could be these guys that went to the east and you know became cultists or they could be like actually good guys or you know we, we don't know what what the story is with them so i just think the fact that 
there's so little known about the Blue Wizards. And if it is going to be one of the Astari, I really, really hope it, it is one of the Blue Wizards. Because they can do anything with those characters and nobody can nobody can give out to them. So, um, mm. yeah, and I, I, want to, I want to learn about the Blue Wizards. I want to know what the showrunners have in, in store for these guys. I don't want them to just like have another attachment to the Lord of the Rings movies and just having a guy called Gandalf and... You know, it's just going to upset people or make people feel weird about the character. Uh, yeah, but whereas Blue Wizard, that's where it's at. That's where it's yeah. at. I, w- I mean, I, I, ha- I would, sorry, I'll let, let you speak in just one, one moment, Johnny. I, I think this was one of my initial concerns, was that very first interview the showrunners did, where I think it was Vanity Fair, and they said, uh, we, don't, we don't think it's Middle Earth without the Hobbits. Um, that made me go, okay, so... Second Age Middle Earth doesn't have the Hobbits, but that made me think that they were feeling that we, the audience, will want some things that we recognise from the Peter Jackson films. Mm -hmm. And so that is the biggest thing, I think, where this idea that it might be Gandalf comes from. Do they think that this could be Middle Earth without Gandalf? I mean, I don't know. You'd have to try and get inside their brains there. But yeah, I would agree with you on the the Blue Wizards. That's who I would now like it to be. But but Johnny, what's your take? No, I was going to just um, add to that. And as Dave said, that's uh, I have the same view of Dave that um, we discussed this when we just were like analyzing the trailers and just even before the trailers, just this idea of this um, uh, this mystery man. And we were saying we would love to see uh, the Blue Wizards arrive at some point and see how their story plays out. But also... I think some people online who are really good at going into these details, uh, they said that the way that people were looking at the the trajectory of the meteor coming in, it didn't quite line up and it didn't really make sense that some people were like standing in this position and looking off that direction. So that means that whatever. whatever. So the other possibility could be that there were in fact two comets that arrived or two meteors that were coming in. And so that would mm. mean that if they didn't line up correctly on the map, it's because people were looking at different meteors that were arriving and it could be the two blue wizards that were arriving and have just basically lost each other and may end up um maybe that's what the that maybe that's why he's looking for his his stars he's trying to find uh the other his partner his other his bro. Um, yeah his palando bro his palando or oh yeah he's trying to find his 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 other friend so i mean that's again i'm is there anything that's that's going to like back up this argument not really just the fact that i would really like for that to be the case and again i agree that i don't really want this to be gandalf and i don't i think that we are more sophisticated than just to need oh it has to have gandalf and it has to have the hobbits because this is middle earth i think we can get behind these new characters and we can enjoy their stories for what they are as well i think as well though that the fact that there there is this whole thing of fire being um a big part of the imagery with the stranger and also it, it kind of looked like there was the eye imagery around him when he mm-hmm. first landed on the on, uh, near the Harfoots. um it does scream a couple of sauron things but i i don't think he is sauron that would be weird but it could be another deception or illusion of sauron and maybe he's nobody really important but he does have some sort of connection to sauron i, I definitely think the whole cold <laughs> flame thing and you know, uh, there's too many flame references, but I don't there know. There were so many f- fire and flame references to start mm-hmm. with, which was why I thought of Balrog. Um, and there were a lot of evil references as well. So uh, I, I, I still hold that when I when I did my video after, I don't know, episode three or four or something, that was what they were hinting at. But they kind of rode back a bit on it now. He's got a bit of ice magic as well. He's got whatever yeah. it is he did to, um, I don't know, was it air magic or a, uh, something to get rid of the wolves? I don't, whatever he did there. So he's, his his magical range is much wider than we perhaps first thought of. Um, for my peoples in the chat saying, I think Nori will have her adventure away from the clan in season two. The stranger will be kidnapped and she'll try to save him. Yeah, I think that's entirely possible. I do want this to tie in with the rest of the story, though. That's the the big thing for me is that I, it, the having a completely separate thing over here of that all of all the this bit of story was to bring up uh, bring this character in and then reveal who they are, but that's not tying in with the rest of the the plot lines. 
I don't know. I wanted to. I wanted to hook in to the rest of the plot lines well, somehow. Well, the one thing that it could connect with is we we saw those characters. Were they the mystics? I think that they're being called. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they seem to be out there searching for the stranger. Or they're following in the in the path of him. So, and I think they're undeniably followers of Sauron or Morgoth. So there is going to be that kind of connection. Maybe he's just a sign of things to come. I'm not sure, but I do think that those mystics do play a bit of a conduit between the two storylines. They, yeah, they definitely do. I mean, they they look evil, but I mean, I don't <laughs> know. There, there's a, a really interesting Mr. Sibley in the chat saying the stranger is sacrificed to imbue the rings with power. Uh, this is the three elf rings, is what we think of them as fire, ice, and air magic. He is showing matches the elf rings perfectly. Wow. I love that idea, yeah. and it's. I mean, I was wanting, say, wanting the stranger to wow, be sacrificed yeah. is probably the wrong way of saying it, but but it seemed to work <laughs> for me uh, thematically having the the stranger be sacrificed. I thought for Mount Doom, but yeah, the it does seem to be fire, ice, and air magic so. far far mm-hmm. maybe, maybe we'll see some more stuff uh, at a later point uh, but let's sort of uh, rattle our way through these uh, questions um Callie summers saying do you think we're likely to see dragons this season or in the more distant future uh, they're active in these parts of the world since they're known to have consumed dwarven rings of power and captured their hordes um so uh, also are dragons Maya like Balrogs? I mean, on that one, uh, no, they don't appear to be the Maya. Um, might we see dragons? I mean, possibly. Sauron is said in Mordor to have collected together most of the of Morgoth's old army. Dragons were in Morgoth's old army. In terms of the timings, they basically a few of them at the end of the first age flew off. Um, to the north and east. The Withered Heath is the place that they mostly seem to be. It's not 100% clear when the dragons attacked the dwarves, but it seems to be in the Third Age. So all of this is sort of adding up in my mind to, well, we could, but there's no specific reason to think that we definitely will. But, I mean, do you do you think we will, or do you think it's likely? For this season or for this entire series? Was, was this I mean, series? I think this season is probably too late now to yeah, be suddenly introducing a dragon, unless it's in, again, a, some sort of a flashback or something. But but yeah, for yeah. later seasons. Yeah, um, you mentioned that there are dragons at this time, but I, I think the, the, the instances that we know of are when they kill the dwarves and, you know, basically burn the rings of power or eat the rings of power or do whatever. So... That would have to be, you know, after the fact, after Sauron has actually gifted out these rings to the race of dwarves and and then they bury deep and gather hordes of treasure. And that's when the dragons attack. So it uh, it's it's possible that we we do see dragons lurking somewhere. Like I think in the first episode, we do see a dragon taking down an eagle. And yeah, I, d- mm-hmm. I don't think if we get any dragons, they're going to play any big parts in the show. I think it might be just another one of those visually stunning uh, flashbacks where we just see an old battle, with some Balrogs and some dragons and this, that and the other. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think that they're they're going to play a part in the show. I can't see them fitting in. OK, uh, unless you've got something particular to add to that, Johnny, I will move us on to a question um, about... Uh, Theo, we, we talked about this very briefly. Mara Lee saying, in the last three episodes, we thought, saw Theo try to do good. He did not disappear with the other villagers to follow Adar. He perhaps reluctantly let go of the sword hilt. Um, do you see him eventually succumbing to the dark side of the force and becoming a Nazgul or something like that? Or or is he actually a good guy? I mean, I, 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 I was challenged again. This was uh, Kelly last week. Um, challenged me on this because I I said he's clearly going down a dark path Um, and uh, her take was that yeah that's the way it looks but when you actually analyze his actions he's he's there saving people he's he's uh, he's the person who suggested uh, how do we try and get some food from the village Um, he's uh, he's 
actively giving up the sword. He actually he's doing a lot of good things. So do you uh, maybe Johnny, you take this one. Do you think he is going to go down an evil path or do you think that there's some kind of hope for redemption for him? Um, I agree with uh, was it Kelly said that last week? Yeah. I, I, I agree with what she's saying that um, for me, I still kind of believe that it's just he seems like the obvious choice of someone that we could kind of form a relationship uh, for only then to be kind of uh, disappointed that he does choose evil in the end. I think that that could be ultimately where he is headed because he has, again, touched the darkness and maybe he's not as strong as Galadriel to be able to t- turn away from that darkness. So he will get a taste for, for that um, power and maybe that could ultimately kind of just stay with him and eventually cause him to to turn down that path. But in terms of his actions, he has done a lot of things that would would like sort of fly in the face of just the obvious. He's become evil. He's only thinking about evil now. And like, as you said, he... He does give up the. He shows Arondir the hilts that he has. He um, even at the end of the most recent episode where he um, where Arondir goes and speaks to him, he's honest and he's open with Arondir. He doesn't try and hide uh, anything. He tells him that he felt power and mm. that he he's now feeling kind of loss for having lost uh, this hilt and this power. So it seems strange that he would be so honest and open with someone uh, and. Uh, for for him then to just kind of go and become evil. So there's two parts there that are um, kind of in conflict with each other. And I don't know, they could go either way. And I, but I just, I, I do feel like he's just the very obvious choice at the moment for someone who could turn out to be evil, but it's a strange one. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'd be happy either way, uh, whichever <laughs> way it goes. I, I feel the same. I feel I'd be happy either way. He, He's shown a lot of good signs, especially in the last episode or two, um, where he looked like he was going down dark path. But he he looks like he's back on track again. But I I don't care. I'm all for him to just become a Nazgul again because I I would much prefer if we see these characters turn evil or turn into Nazguls. I'd much prefer to be attached to them and yeah mm. having to go through that pain. I'm ready yeah. to hurt again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's that's really important because we know there will be nine humans who become Nazgul and mm-hmm. it's not in the too distant future. Next season presumably the rings will be forged so maybe the season after that they're going to be distributed. So we would expect some of these people we have met already. So how many of the nine will we know personally? They must show us at least two or three. I've got a few people in Numenor that I think are probably going to go down that route. Um, mm. But the the big giveaway, as you said, Johnny, when he talks about he missing power, and when he says, "I felt powerful when I had mm. that uh, sword hilt," and it's that I think is the key. He will want power, and that is what being given a ring of power is going mm. to be a, a sort of a a bit of a, a, a slide down to the dark side for him, unfortunately. Yeah, I said um, I'd be happy. I said I'd be happy with either either result, but I, I think I definitely would prefer to see him become evil because I think that's yeah. a more interesting story. <laughs> it would make for yeah, it would make for I, a, a good story. Sorry, I, I also want to say that I kind of really thought the way that the last episode was shaping up. I thought that Bronn was going to be killed in that in that last battle. And I mm. thought that that was going to have a knock-on effect on both Theo and Arondir. And I thought it was going to push Theo back, like, further down that dark road. And I thought Arondir was going to have this sort of more internal conflict of, I don't know, just, um, I thought that it would be a really interesting development for his character as well. But she survived, so um, that's obviously not what, what's happened, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. But I thought that's that was really shaping up to where uh, to, to how that episode was going to go for me. Yeah, I agreed. I, I thought, I mean, we've not really had characters we care about die yet. So mm-hmm. at some point, presumably they will they will do that. But um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I was disappointed that she survived, but uh, I thought it would have been quite a, a good, given how much we've brought into her character, or I have anyway, um, that that would have been quite a, a, a good twist. Let's put it that way. Mm. 
Um, question from 444 saying, I was surprised by something that I read in James Hibbard's article in the Ho Hollywood Reporter, um, which was the, I tweeted about this, uh, I think I said earlier in the stream, if you're interested, it's, it is a really interesting read. Um, they, the showrunner said, one of the big things we learned was even from season one, was even when it's a small scene, it always has to tie back into the larger stakes. Um, and 444 says, I know little about writing, but is this not a basic thing of storytelling? Is this the reason uh, they operate with so many secrets to attract the viewers? Um, one secret was revealed last week that the uh, sword is in fact a key to the dam. If the resolution to other secrets will be the same kind, it won't be very compelling. I find most of your and your guests' ideas much more compelling than those of the show. Well, I mean, uh, I sometimes it's fun to let your imagination run wild but in terms of the the using the small scenes tying them back into the the larger stakes do you uh, do you get i mean maybe um dave you want to pick up on this one is that do you what do you think they mean now i don't know whether you read the whole article but that was it was cut and pasted out from that art, article what do you think that when they were talking about lessons learned from season 1 that's the thing that they uh, picked up on what what do you think they mean about the small scenes having to tie in with the big ones well initially i was going to say what small scenes are these because most of the show is like you know it's moving at a pace that you know we need to cover a lot in every single scene everything seems to be quite big unless the small scenes they're referring to is actually the time we we spend with the harfoots and if that's the case then that would be good for what you suggested earlier that you wanted them to tie into the overall arching story and if 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 that is what they mean they might say like look the big scenes are when we're seeing the the the, the grandeur of Numenor or we're, we're over in Mordor and we're dealing with all that or just in beautiful places like Linden but then the smaller scenes is when it's just like a couple of hardfoots and ta -ta 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 -ta. but like <laughs> they're going to eventually tie into the overarching story so that that was the first time I heard that so that's all that's all I can put towards it because every other small scene I don't know what what other small scenes that we could be talking about are they talking about Kemen and that the girl like their love story I hope that doesn't play into the overarching Aryan. <laughs> Aryan, yeah um like you know he's probably going to be a Nazgul like that's the only thing um, oh yeah that, there. definitely yeah. yeah but like I yeah I don't really think there are too many small scenes really yeah what do you guys think um I, yeah no I, I i don't really know i think um i mean it does seem like okay that should be basic uh writing of anything yeah that we should we shouldn't have scenes that are just completely you know uh throw away-able uh because otherwise they would be cut because i think there's plenty of things that they could have added in as well that they maybe should have done from in my opinion to clear things up um but as well i don't think I mean, some parts of movies that I love are not like I think Tarantino is quite good at this, like including scenes that don't have anything to do with the plot just to kind of get to know your characters a little bit better. Like, you know, there's the famous the whole conversation of the Royale with cheese from Pulp Fiction, mm. <laughs> which, again, it's got nothing to do with the plot, but that's just a really cool piece of dialogue. And it's just a believable piece of dialogue between two characters that you're getting to know. So. I think if things are done in a good way and if the writing is good, then I don't really worry if it's too exactly connected. If everything, like not every single scene for me has to be directly connected. Sometimes when that happens, it's too obvious. Like for if somebody, I don't know, says a random, just like seems like a throwaway comment. If you're like every single comment is important for the dialogue, it just seems like it's not really a real world. It's just like doesn't seem like it's natural so um yeah i i, I don't really have a, an, an exact answer but that's that's my opinion that like if the writing is done well it doesn't need to always be directly uh, connected it, it can just be fun and we can get to know the characters a little bit better and yeah i think that can be as good as uh, yeah i think i would i think i'd agree with that it's an odd kind of Thing to pick up on it does make me wonder whether there, there was a scene or something that they in particular 
maybe fans had picked up on something that was there, said there and assumed that this must have been important, but actually they thought they were just writing some kind of random uh, scene, uh, but like they wanted to tie Dorothy. things in. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, I hope that they elaborate on this at some point because it, it's an odd thing to say. Mm. And I, I agree completely. I don't actually want everything to tie in together. I don't need every mm. single scene to be about the meta plot. Some of them can be character development. So, yeah, I don't know. It's it's an odd thing to to pick up on, but we'll yeah we'll I'm sure we'll find out a little bit more <laughs> in time. Then depending on what we see in season two, that will be their learning because they basically said season one they've learned a lot from season two one and they will be. Uh, making a few tweaks into season two is basically what they Scratch were saying. Scratch Gandalf and type in <laughs> the wizard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so for example, I, I do wonder whether they, um, as an example, with the um, the Fireflies, maybe they were just wanting to have a, a thing there where it's the, his, his, a, uh, showing a little bit of magic but then everyone went oh but they the fireflies died that must be really important to the plot and they took the learning point that if we do something like that it has to be important to the plot not just a a thing which people take as a clue because people are going to pour over every detail i don't know uh mm -hmm. moderators thank you so much i can uh i can see that they're uh, um uh, just having chats about that just for uh, if, if you're new here, my chat here, the live stream chats are intended to be a safe space for absolutely everyone. So the thing that I always say to my moderators is that the constructive debate is always welcome. Uh, anything which is aimed at anybody in particular is is not because this has to be a safe space for absolutely everyone. So moderators, thank you so much. If you are in the chat, uh, could you please show a little bit of love to the moderators because they do fantastic work. We've got just a couple more questions. Um, I've kept these guys uh, going for quite a while here, but we've got a couple more questions just to quickly flick through. Um, uh, we've got... Uh, sea Green Mango saying, I'm curious what you think about time compression. This was the thing that I was most concerned about before the show um, actually uh, aired. Um, compared, uh, comparing what's in the Silmarillion versus the series as a whole. Um, when I see where we're at, I have to wonder how they'll fill up four more seasons. You can't really do one for one mapping of the events, but, but to me it feels like they've skipped the War of Sauron and the Elves and we're near the end of the Second Age. Um, granted that the sh in the show the rings have yet to be forged um so what's your what's what's your take i mean my my take is that very broadly speaking the the first a thousand years of the second age have happened before we come into this action so that's not compressed then everything else in the rest of the second age is going to be squashed into these five seasons into the life of the the characters that we have there so the the life of elendil and isildur so that's where the squashing is and so from every all the events that we've got there the forging of the rings the, the war of the elves and sauron um the distribution of the rings the um uh, the whole numenor arc with the fall of uh, of numenor leading up to the last alliance of elves and men that should all happen in the show so i don't Personally, I don't have a uh, a problem with wondering whether or not they're going to be able to fit everything in. I think they will just squash it to, to get uh, in. There were other questions there about pacing and the like. But what's your... I mean, I know you will have thought about this as well. Um, uh, Dave, I'll come to you first on this one. Um, with the time compression, how has it... I think everyone had concerns about this. How do you think it has worked so far? Yeah, that was that was one of the main um, issues before we went into the show. And I think at this point in the series, I've just, I've gotten over it and I think it's, it's grand. I've, uh, I've become hardy to the fact that we're just going to have everything compressed and we're like, they wanted to keep the same actors um, for all five seasons and they didn't want to be killing off cast mem or cast members. They didn't want to be killing off <laughs> characters in the show. <laughs> um, they certainly wouldn't want to be killing off cast members that would be an awful from Amazon. that would be a bit harsh wouldn't it yeah <laughs> that would be very harsh but uh yeah no i think i think it was very good that they told us 
they dropped that immediately and everyone kind of argued about it for months and months before the show came out and I'm kind of numb to it now and I don't really mind it's it's the new stuff that you don't want to you know if you watch a new episode and you're like oh I didn't really like the way they talk about Mithril in that episode these are the kind of things that worry me now I'm over the whole time compression thing but in terms of this person asks how they're going to fill up the rest of the seasons like that's that's not going to be a problem at all i think we're going to have one big main canonical thing happening at the end of every season where you know this season it, it'll either be sauron revealing himself or the forging of the rings and then you know next next season it could be just like the whole rise of sauron and how he's gotten to power and then there's obviously the downfall of numenor and obviously the last one will be the the war of the last alliance um so I don't I don't have any fears of how they're going to like fill up the rest of the show. I think there's just going to be a kind of a uh, maybe like a restart again at the at the start of every season and getting to that big canonical event that's going to happen in the season finale. But yeah, uh, in terms of this time compression, yeah, it's, it's a TV show. They they had we, we knew that they had to do it. Of course, they could have done something like just had a TV show on the downfall of of Numenor and had a TV show on Sauron's time as Anator in Eregion but they, they've done that they, they want to do the whole thing and we're just going to have to sit here and watch it and if you enjoy <laughs> it that's great if you don't that's also great too <laughs> awesome um Johnny is there anything you want to I'm I'm going to start to bring this one to a close is there anything else that you want to um, um add into this mix uh, either on the time compression or or what else you're really looking forward to from the rest of this season well just to go on the time compression thing uh yeah of course we've uh, as Dave pointed out there we've known about this for so long now so we kind of we're starting to just accept it and it's not that much of a big deal anymore but I am curious to see how they how it plays out especially when sauron eventually gives the rings to the nine men and how they become ring rates because we know that that's supposed to take hundreds of years that process so that's going to be a bit of a strange one how maybe it's going to be just kind of a sort of a it's going to have to be a lot quicker that uh, transition from men into into rates um but i remember i remember all of this like complaining about you know the the um the, the the time being compressed and this is terrible and we, we, we it's it's you know it's against the lore and uh, I remember when I was like watching episode three or four of House of the Dragon and they had like that three year jump and then two episodes later they had the ten year jump and I know that you're loving the way everything's going but for me as mm. a person that hasn't I haven't read the books I it, it, that was really jarring for me and I was like whoa hang on and it took me. I didn't enjoy those initial episodes as much as I did the, for example, the first little three-year jump. I, I I enjoyed that episode a little bit less. And then the 10-year jump, I enjoyed that episode a little bit less as well. I've already now, since in the most recent episode, I've got back into, like, enjoy these characters. But I felt like I was complaining about there being a time compression in Lord of the Rings. And then I was complaining about there being a, a, a time jump in the House of the Dragon. And I thought, like, it's it's obviously difficult for them to do it because they, you know, it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I think they've just chosen this. They're going with this decision, and I'm gonna, I'm on board with it now. I'm just gonna to have to try and get behind it and enjoy it because I don't want to just be complaining about it on Twitter for the next however ten <laughs> years or however long this show is. So I'm gonna try and enjoy it as best as I can. So, um, but as opposed to uh, what was your other question about what I'm hoping to see towards the end of this? Yeah, what, what are you looking forward to? As this, the next two episodes or the whole yeah. season as a whole? Yeah. Um I'm just. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I'm looking forward to finally getting that. As you said, I'd I'd like to see that reveal of um, Halbrand walking up to Celebrimbor and like mm-hmm. having their reunion. That would be a really cool thing. But I'm just looking forward to seeing Sauron. I'm 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 looking forward to not having the discussion of who is Sauron anymore. I really hope that they don't leave us doing <laughs> for a couple of years on that. Oh, that's so um, true. If they finish this this season and it's like oh we still don't know who Sauron is, I'll I'll I don't know. And it won't be twenty twenty. I'll eat my hat until twenty twenty four. Yeah, I yeah, have to talk about this for another three years. <laughs> yeah, speculating on who. Yes, yeah, so is 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 Halbrand Sauron? Imagine two more years of his Halbrand Sauron. Oh, um, oh. Okay, I think with that, I'm going to uh, start to draw this one to a close, guys. Thank you so much for coming. On. Do you want to just uh, remind people where they can find you on the internet? 
Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thanks a million for having us on again. Uh, it was great to see you because we haven't mm. seen you in so long. But yeah, mm. if anyone wants to follow us, you can, well, first of all, you can follow us on Twitter at Melon underscore heads and that's Melon with two L's. Uh, but if you are interested in listen to myself and Johnny's thoughts, and we also have regular guests on, especially recently where we break down the Rings of Power episodes, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any of the places where you get your podcasts, and most recently in on YouTube. So we're we're kind of just starting off there. I think the last time we came onto Robert's stream, we we were like under a hundred subscribers, and then I think you bumped us to. 200 or something so i think we're floating around that 650 range now so come on guys go uh go check <laughs> us out and uh, <laughs> oh, i'm just just trying to plug the show as much as you can but yeah on youtube we are the council of elrond or the melon heads whichever you look up there should get you to our podcast so yeah excellent and there is a link to that down in the description and i would very much recommend it i only have people on this show who i would personally recommend what they do <laughs> and, and these guys are excellent and so uh, if you want a little bit more of that melon heady goodness uh, then do go and check them out and yeah i'm sure we can push you up over 700 that ah, must be doable that's, that's um <laughs> right let me i'll make you disappear for just one second so i can point at a few things if you're watching this back a little bit later you will find appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to other live streams that I've done appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to my Patreon page, which is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. Uh, but uh, that's all for this time. We've got the episode itself is coming out very soon, just a few hours time. Uh, so look out for my breakdown video for that coming tomorrow. And then we've got uh, Sunday. Uh, my next live stream is going to be a House of the Dragon one. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you moderators. And thank you to everyone who has been donating. I hugely appreciate it. There is still an opportunity. There will be a link somewhere uh, for you to donate if you're watching this back a bit later. But uh, thanks everyone. Take care. And I shall see you again soon. Bye-bye.